Still waiting on one board member. Community, we apologize for the delay. We're waiting on one more board member to switch over from the closed session to the open session. Okay, great. All right, as permitted by Governor Pritzker's Executive Order 2020-07, 2020-33, and 2020-39, the Naperville Community Unit School District 203, DuPage County, Illinois, will convene a remote regular meeting on August 3rd at 6 o'clock p.m. via Zoom. Since 6 o'clock p.m., the board has been in closed session to consider the following. The appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district or legal counsel for the district. Litigation, when an action against, affecting, or on behalf of the particular district has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal. And collective negotiating collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives. I will entertain a motion to come out of closed session. So moved, Donna Wanfi. Second. Second Kush. Second Kush. I hear a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Leong. Aye. Yang Roar. Aye. Fitzgerald. Aye. Gerke? Aye. Wanke? Aye. Kush? Aye. Kosminski? Aye. Okay, the motion passes. We are in open session. Good evening and welcome to our August 3rd board meeting. Our mission is to educate students to be self-directed learners, collaborative workers, complex thinkers, and community contributors. Please call the roll, Mrs. Patton. Board members present this evening, Kristen Fitzgerald, Donna Wanke, Paul Leong, Janet Yangroar, Christine Gerke, and Charles Kush, and Joe Kosminski. Okay. Um, at this point, will you please join the Board of Education in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we've reached the point in our agenda for good news. I just wanted to share with uh, the board and the community that uh, in her Tuesday, July 28th, 2020, uh, weekly message to uh, school district superintendents uh, and school district, uh, the uh, Naperville Community Unit School District 203 uh, Board of Education and School District was recognized by the state superintendent uh, for our work regarding uh, equity and diversity. Um, I'll just, I'll read from her message. Uh, again, this is coming from uh, Dr. Carmen Ayala, the uh, Illinois State Superintendent of Schools. The past few months have shown us in vivid, often graphic detail, how far our nation still falls short of reaching its guiding principle of equity. I'm proud that many districts across Illinois have taken a public stand in support of communities of color. Just last month, the Board of Naperville Community Unit School District 203 adopted a resolution reaffirming District 203 commitment to equity for all students, overcoming systemic racism and ending racial injustice. And it begins by listing significant constructive steps the board has taken uh, in 2019. Uh, she goes on to talk about uh, the resolution acknowledging uh, that despite all the advocacy and action, we have a lot of work to do need to be committed to this uh, as we move forward. Uh, so congratulations to the board and the district uh, for your leadership on the state level in this area. Wonderful, thank you for that good news. Okay, we have reached the point in our agenda for public comment. The Board of Education welcomes comments from the public at its meetings. Issues raised during public comment will be taken under advisement by the Board of Education, but will not be discussed this evening. 
Issues raised during public participation may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff. The superintendent is the board's designee to coordinate response to public co comments and will apprise the board accordingly. As has been communicated, one of our considerations in holding this meeting virtually was to allow all community members who wish to comment this opportunity. Attached in board docs are our 462 pages of public comment. Um, I will now yield to, I believe, our superintendent who will summarize those public comments. Yes, once again, thank you to the members of the community who have submitted your uh, public comment for the board uh, and the administration to review. Uh, engagement uh, from the community is important to us. Uh, again, all public comments that have been received um, by the deadline of 4 p.m. have been posted. There may have been some additional that have been added. Uh, if not, they will be. Uh, but for now, uh, they are posted in board docs as a part of the public record of this meeting. Just in summary, as you can imagine, we've received a number of communications in support uh, of our uh, change in our return to learn plan. We've also received a number of public comments that are opposed to the changes that we've had in support of the previous plan. Uh, other themes that uh, were most prominent throughout the comments uh, dealt with uh, plans for returning, when that would happen and what we, how we'd make those decisions. Uh, the importance of having some live streaming as part of the instructional practices, um, how much engagement should be expected by teachers in, in the new e-learning. Uh, and then uh, uh, just a concern about how spring remote learning worked for students uh, and the hope that it would, it would be better. And as we'll talk in our presentation a little bit later, um, uh, this evening, uh, I can promise you that the type of the quality of instruction in the program that we offer will be much different, much more rigorous than what was a part of the remote learning. So I think that summarizes them again, all, all public comments received are posted as part of the record. Okay, so on behalf of the entire Board of Education, I wanted to take a moment to thank the many, many students, parents, teachers, and community residents who have taken the time to express your concerns, questions, viewpoints, and suggestions to the Board of Education over the past three weeks. We once again, as we did last meeting, have an extraordinary amount of public comment. I wanna assure our community that we have read every one of your emails. We share your love and belief in your students and you. We appreciate your passion about what you believe is right and we thank you for your advocacy. Many of you, after sending us many concerns and thoughts, reached back to say thank you after the district's decision was announced on Friday. Thank you. We know that many of you have also expressed your support for hybrid learning and your concerns with remote learning. We share your support for a return to hybrid learning in stages, and we hope that all of your questions will be answered in tonight's presentation. Though the superintendent is the board's designee to respond to public comment, we want you to know that your comments have been heard by the Board of Education. Okay, so I'm gonna go to action by consent. Um, I will entertain a motion for adoption of the consent agenda. Donna Wonke, I move to approve the consent agenda, item 6.01, the personnel report, and item 6.02, the lend dues for the year 2020-2021. Second, Gerke. Motion is second or heard. Please call the roll, Mrs. Patton. Bush. Aye. Leong. Aye. Yang Roar. Aye. Fitzgerald. Aye. Wanke. Aye. Kazminski. Aye. Gerke. Aye. And I would uh, just briefly comment. Uh, congratulations to Stephanie Posey, who uh, by board action has officially been appointed the interim assistant superintendent for secondary education. I end to Jay Wachtel, who by officially by board action has been named the interim principal at Neighborville North High School. Congratulations. Uh, we're fortunate to have both leaders in the positions that they're in. Okay, um, I see a, a hand raise. Paul, do you have a hand raise? I'm sorry, is that an oh, error? Oh, that was a silent applause. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. The board is very appreciative of, the do of your new duties and we congratulate both of you on your new uh, assignments. Okay, uh, and the motion passed. I didn't get a chance to say that. Sorry. Okay. That's all right. Okay, so we'll move on to our agenda to communications um, and we will go to item 7.01, superintendent staff school report. And then we'll go to item 7.02, return to learn update. Those are both together, correct, Dan? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So before we begin, I do wanna say a few things on behalf of the district and the Board of Education. Uh, the return to learn plan is vitally important to our community. This is an unprecedented time. 
Our students, teachers, parents, administration, and community face challenges we've never faced before. Returning to learn during a pandemic is like nothing our school district, and frankly, our nation, has ever experienced. Recent social media posts about our district's reopening plans allege wrongdoing, neglect, even secret votes by the board, all of which are completely false. I wanna set the record straight with the facts and then move forward to the important business of the board. A district team comprised of educators, administrators, and other staff has been working on our return to learn plan for months, long before state guidance became available. This team was led by our district 203 administration. Together, the administrators who sat at this planning table have a shared almost 100 years of service to students, teachers, and parents in this district. Dan Bridges has served our district as superintendent for the past nine years. He has 25 years of service in education. The team who developed our return to learn plan is the same team responsible for the hard work that has resulted in District 203 having the greatest number of exemplary schools of any unit district in Illinois. Something we are all very proud of and something we are committed to maintaining and enhancing. Throughout the planning process, the board has been regularly updated and consulted. Some of the basic parameters of the staffing needs for the district's initial return to learn plan were presented to the board at our June 25th closed session meeting. The board subsequently received an outline for the full plan July 9th and the draft proposal on July 10th. Throughout this process, our Board of Education has submitted dozens of questions that have been answered by district administrators. But it's important to remember that board members are not elected to formulate educational plans. The board is well trained by the Illinois Association of School Boards that our role is governance, not operations. We are elected to represent our students, parents, teachers, and community, all of you, in providing the oversight necessary to ensure that the district's academic programs and services, and I'm quoting from the Illinois Association of School Boards Code of Conduct, represent the interests of the entire community. To prepare to evaluate the district's return to learn plan, our board participated in webinars by legal counsel, attended statewide meetings with the Illinois Association of School Boards, joined in weekly calls with benchmark districts, and studied developing plans in districts across the metro area and throughout the United States. We followed and tracked emerging health data, as well as studied our local and state health information. Many of us have worked on this issue for months, including reading and hearing from the community on their many viewpoints. The plan that has been developed by our district administration has been designed to protect the safety and health of our staff and students, ensure their academic success, and help them feel supported and not isolated. We know that our families also face very difficult challenges. Some of us are struggling to work and provide for our families while working with our students at home. Some are facing medical conditions that put us at higher risk. And always, all of us want what's best for our children. This is our, nar our North Star and it guides every decision we make. As our superintendent has communicated, our new plan launches our school year on September 1 with remote learning for all students, while recognizing the importance of in-person learning and planning for a return to school when it can be as safe and productive as possible for everyone. I know I can speak for all of us when I say, we promise to continue to advocate on your behalf, to question and improve, to listen and respond, to collaborate with you to ensure that our exceptional district remains exceptional during this extremely challenging time. We ask for your understanding of the fact that this is a year unlike any other, and we assure you that the board and the administration who have served you faithfully and with the best intentions will continue to work tirelessly on your behalf. We will get through this together. We wanna thank all of you for your support and partnership. Hey, Dan, I would love it if you put in item 7.02, return to learn update. Great, if we could bring up the uh, presentation, please. Okay, and we'll remain on this slide for just a few moments, please. Um, the Neighborhood 203 community places an extremely high value on education. Our district's beliefs acknowledge that. We believe an exemplary school district is the result 
of a collective partnership of students, staff, parents, and community. I value that collaborative commitment and I take my role as your superintendent personally. Although I often counsel members of uh, my team not to take things personally, I fail to take my own advice sometimes, especially on this one. I do take this job personally. I have a daughter who will be a high school senior in our district and is looking forward to getting back to school and to enjoying all that is supposed to come with the senior year. My family boasts four past Naperville 203 graduates. So the decisions I make not only impact you and your kids, they impact my family as well. These are unprecedented times. We're facing challenges like none we faced before. And quite frankly, they're challenges we didn't necessarily sign up for. But that is who we are and who we will continue to be. And I am proud of our work and how the April 203 team has responded to these challenges. Have we been perfect? Nope. Are there things we could have done better or done differently? Sure. Have we learned how to be better through this process? Absolutely. Have we worked tirelessly to solve the challenges in front of us? No question, yes. Has our work been grounded in equity and what's best for all, not just a few? For certain. And without question, every decision we have made, we have, made, we have done so by recognizing our important role in the community and with the health, safety, and wellness of our 16,500 students and 2,400 employees on the forefronts of our minds. Unfortunately, we recognize any decision that is made on returning to learn in the fall will not please everyone. We have to accept that as much as we do not like it, there are sacrifices being made by all of us. Thank you for your continued patience and understanding during these volatile times. This decision was not what any of us had hoped for, and we will continue to move forward in providing the best possible education and support for our students under these new circumstances. And with that, as we transition into the, power, the presentation, tonight our team will update the Board of Education and Community on the revised plans for reopening schools for the 2020-2021 school year. The Naperville 203 administration presented our initial return to learn plan to the Board of Education and Community on July 13th, 2020. At that time, I advised the board and community this was a fluid process, subject to change based on guidelines from the Illinois State Board of Education, the Illinois Department of Public Health and other agencies. On Thursday, July 23, 2020, the State Board, with guidance from the Illinois Department of Public Health, released its Fall 2020 learning recommendations, 10 days after our initial plan was released. As the Naperville 203 team has unpacked and reviewed the most recent guidelines in relation to our initial plans, we have concluded that the return to learn plan we presented on July 13, 2020 needed to be modified based on updated guidance. We are adjusting our plan. While we are adjusting our plan, our return to learn goals remain consistent. As educators, we recognize the great need for students to get back to in-person learning. And therefore, as a committee, we set two goals for our work. First was to develop a plan that can be responsive to changes in safety and health needs created by the pandemic, but also focused on returning all students to in-person instruction. Additionally, we focused on returning all students to in-person instruction and creating academic and social emotional conditions to promote continuing their education. The guiding principles we developed in the spring continue to guide our work. As always, our plans must continue to align and support our district mission as that is what defines us. We also know that our plans need to align across levels since many families have students in different buildings and at different levels across the district. All plans need to include academic and social emotional needs and promote equity for all students. ISBE has also reinstated that all schools ensure students engage in five hours of instruction and or learning each day. I don't think any of us needs a reminder of how long we've been navigating this pandemic. Since I made the decision on Friday, March 13, to suspend in-person instruction for Naperville 203 through the end of March, followed by the governor's decision to suspend learning for the state to ultimately ending in-person instruction for the 2019-2020 school year, my team has worked tirelessly to make instructional shifts necessary to continue, to continue educating and supporting our students and our community. We have shifted from our normal school life as we know it to a short-term e-learning plan, then we shifted to a state-mandated remote learning plan, and we did that seamlessly and professionally 
always with the goal of providing the best possible experience we could for all of our students. I could not be more proud of our administrators, our educators, our support staff, bus drivers, our buildings, grounds, maintenance staff, who all rolled up their sleeves to do whatever it took. Often things that were not normally part of their regular schedule or regular work duties to make it all happen. The Naperville 203 team has been planning for a return to learn in 2020, 2021 in earnest since early May. Our plans, as I have said repeatedly, have followed state and local guidance that has often changed and been updated, causing us to rethink our plans. We've relied on the state and federal public health and education agencies for guidance on how we can and must provide for the health and safety of students and staff. And from the onset, this guidance contained information that in many ways appeared contradictory and conflicting. Over time, these contradictions have not been resolved, they've only intensified, and we've continued to receive conflicting answers on vital safety questions on different days from different sources. Additionally, as we have seen the impact of the pandemic on our local community evolve, our plans have had to evolve as well. There is no script for this, there is no manual, and there is no playbook. Further, it is hard to hit a target when that target keeps moving. This will serve as a good point for me to remind everyone, the plan we present tonight is our plan as of August 3rd, 2020. As guidance and conditions evolve, so will our plans. And I'd like to thank the members of our administration and dozens of educators who have been involved in the development and evolution of our work. It has been a collaborative process. We have concluded that the return to learn plan presented on July 13, 2020 needed to be modified. And after much deliberation, we've determined that in consideration of the most recent guidelines, the best way for Naperville 203 to support the health and safety of our students and staff, meet our and your high expectations for teaching and learning, and to provide appropriate social experiences for our students, and to return to in-person learning as soon as possible, we will begin the 2020-2021 school year with an e-learning model and will slowly transition into the hybrid learning model for those who are able and eventually return to learning in person. In order to best prepare for this plan, we're also recommending the first day of school for students be moved to Tuesday, September 1st. The plan we present this evening is staged to allow it to be responsive to changes in safety and health needs created by the pandemic, but also focused on returning all students to in-person instruction. Since we presented our plan on July 13th, some things have changed, which caused us to pause and reconsider the best way to begin the school year. The state of Illinois as a whole and DuPage and Will counties have seen an increase in the overall positivity rate of COVID-19 cases. In DuPage County, for example, the most significant increase in COVID cases is among individuals who fall in the 10 to 19 year old age group and the 20 to 29 year old age group. The executive director of the DuPage County Health Department had recently described in a phone conversation, this trend is disturbing. The governor has issued warnings related to the resurgence of the virus within our state and the possibility of reversals in the restore Illinois phases. DuPage County has now met at least one of the metrics that is used by the state to place the county on a warning level. We were facing a strong likelihood that we would be forced to shift to e-learning within the first few weeks of school, creating greater uncertainty for our students and staff. On July 23, 2020, the Illinois State Board of Education issued new guidance that provided new parameters for online learning and clarified some health and safety guidelines. The new guidance impacts our ability to implement the plan as first presented. Operational considerations that define how we separate large spaces in order to serve more students have now changed to require floor to ceiling physical barriers that also meet fire code. Updated guidelines call for at least two and a half hours of synchronous instruction could not achieve this in our initial hybrid model under our current staffing model. In the event of a positive case, required quarantining of up to 14 days of those in close contact would significantly impact instruction and consistency. Operationalizing the required daily sim symptom check and monitoring, especially among our youngest students, proved to be challenging. Also concern and uncertainty regarding how schools should respond in the event of a student or staff member testing positive. Recent guidance from the CDC now states that school districts should develop routines that would prevent the frequent quarantine of students. By starting slowly and intentionally, this will help us reduce the community spread and reduce the need to quarantine. Preparing staff to be ready to welcome students to in-person learning 
and understand the protocols and procedures for each individual space within the building is also part of our rationale. More students selected the online academy than was expected based on our initial survey data. Based on those selections and the number of faculty and staff who would have required health accommodations, our initial plan did not work within our staffing model. The learning needs survey is posted on our Return to Learn website. And finally, a greater understanding of how the health and safety guidelines will impact the important work of creating a community of learners within the classroom and the ongoing uncertainty we continue to experience as a result of the pandemic. Dr. Christine Igo, the Assistant Superintendent for Student Services, will discuss the impact of this pandemic on all stakeholders. It's important for us to acknowledge that every single person has been impacted by this pandemic and every one of us is living in a time of uncertainty and adjusting to the new social distancing guidelines that are impacting both our, prof our professional and personal lives. For many of us, this is the first time we are living in a time of constant unknowns. These events are impacting our overall sense of physical and social emotional safety. As we are planning for the reopening of school, we needed to take this into consideration for not only our students, but also for our staff. Research tells us that when people do not feel safe or they're feeling as if they don't have control in the situation, it is important for us to provide connections to others, clear routine and structure, and predictability whenever possible. As Mr. Bridges mentioned previously, the more information that we learned, the more uncertain it was becoming that we would be actually able to start the school year with in-person learning. We wanted to provide all students, staff, and families with a plan we knew could be implemented on the first day of school, regardless of the state of our circumstances. Additionally, an online start to the school year allows for us to support staff in their return to work. Staff will be able to open the, be in the buildings first without students to better understand how those health and safety guidelines are going to be implemented within their classrooms. Providing time to teach students those new routines and regulations before, student enter, before students enter our buildings. And to share with students what the classroom and building will look like virtually before they, become in, before they come for in-person learning. Starting the year with e-learning allows us to implement some of the best practice strategies to combat that acute trauma that this pandemic has caused all of our students and staff to suffer through. In addition for the need for predictability, routines and structures, we know that strong positive relationships plays a significant role in ensuring people feel safe and comfortable. In preparation for the start of the year, we welcomed our new educators on July 23rd and 24th with the new health and safety guidelines in place. This allowed us to see how those guidelines were going to impact the building of relationships between the teacher and the student and between students. Relationships are always important, but this year they're even more important. We know that connection to others is critical for building a sense of safety for our students. Following our new educator experience, it became clear to us that building connections would be hindered by how vastly different school is going to look and feel with those required health and safety guidelines. The pictures on this slide provide the stark differences between what school looked like when students left us in March and what they will look like when students, students return to us this fall. We believe e-learning to start the school year will provide a better environment for building relationships and it would benefit our students to come into the building slowly once they had a trusting relationship with the teacher and the opportunity to learn and hear how routine structures and learning specifically in their classrooms was going to look and feel different. Jane Willard, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction will now walk through how we will slowly transition from e-learning to the revised hybrid model. As you can see from the graphic above, we have broken down a return to learn plan into four stages. I will further unpack each stage as we move through this presentation. However, for the first six weeks of school, we will begin in stage one, where every student will begin the school year in an e-learning model. During the first six weeks, we will evaluate our district's readiness to move to the next step. Our ultimate goal is to reach stage four with all of our students and staff back to regular, full-time in-person instruction as quickly as the Illinois Department of Health and ISBE guidelines allow. It is important to note for our families who have already signed up for the online academy, we will continue to have the option of an e-learning model through stages one, two, and three. 
However, since all students will be in an e-learning model to start the year, our online academy students will automatically be enrolled back into their home schools, original schedules and programs with the rest of the student population. Through the duration of phase four and the restored Illinois plan, students who need to remain in an online environment or initially registered for the online academy may continue to learn in the e-learning model when we transition to a hybrid model. We will provide all educators with professional development and blended learning that will strengthen our ability to connect students in the classroom and online. Educators will determine the best methodology for online students to participate in their classes. During every stage, all buildings will be opened and staffed daily with a full administrative team on site. As mentioned during as mentioned, during each of our stages, we will plan to be strategic in evaluating our readiness for movement forward to the next stage of learning. This assessment will take place approximately every six weeks and will consider the state metrics, IDPH and ISBE guidelines. We will evaluate our ability to maintain inventory and refill necessary PPE and ensure that we are staffed to cover all operations and absences. We will evaluate our students' academic and social emotional needs while also confirming our staff and facilities readiness to transition to the next stage. The information will be communicated to all stakeholders prior to transitioning to the next stage. Before we provide details on each stage of our learning model, it is extremely important for all to understand that the e-learning model we are proposing will be drastically different from the model we were forced to operate under in the spring. I will repeat, our e-learning model is much different from our remote learning that we experienced this spring. In our revised e-learning model, students will engage in at least five hours of instruction or learning activities, including at least two and a half hours being live teacher-led sessions. We will maintain our district grading practices and policies, which are aligned and based on age appropriate expectations and rigor. Student engagement and the continuation of learning occurs mostly through online structures where students will have scheduled time for synchronous instruction delivered by the teacher and asynchronous time to assess information or access information and work independently. Students' daily schedules will be reflective of what a typical school day looks like in our in-person setting. There will be daily live instruction and the format will follow a student's daily schedule. Students will be expected to log in regularly and follow the traditional start and end time for each level. The first stage of our transition to in-person learning requires us to begin school in an e-learning model. This model provides a cohesive start to the school year with all students attending class virtually every day as a full class. This provides the most consistency for our learners and families with the ever-changing guidelines. This model also allows our buildings to better prepare and plan for transitioning students into the building. In-person instruction will gradually begin for our students served in specialized classrooms in a one-to-one -one or two-to-one situation. Starting the year in the e-learning environment requires students to leverage technology to receive instructions from their teacher on a daily basis. All students will have a set schedule that they can count on each day. During the first few weeks of school, it is imperative that students build relationships with their teachers and peers. We believe the e-learning environment allows this to happen with greater consistency and authenticity compared to a hybrid in-person environment at this time with all of the additional health and safety guidelines that we are required to implement. We are confident our professional staff will build a safe, welcoming community of learners while establishing structures and routines that promote academic and social emotional development. Priorities for our teachers continue to be ensuring students feel safe and connected. There will be a high level of reliance on good digital citizenship that both our staff and families will partner to develop. In stage one, we're able to continue some extracurricular activities following health and safety guidelines and IHSA regulations. 
This slide provides a sample of a high school student's schedule during e-learning. Students will follow their normal schedule with period one starting at 7 a.m., 7.45 a.m. and the day ending at 3.10. During each period of instruction, there will be approximately 25 minutes of synchronous time with their teacher and class and approximately 25 minutes of asynchronous or independent work time. Opportunities to access help will be communicated to students and will occur at various times throughout the day or week. The weekly late arrival schedule will continue as in previous school years for professional collaboration, but will occur on Monday mornings rather than Wednesdays while this e-learning schedule is in place. Students will be responsible for reporting to each period every day. This middle school sample schedule for e-learning follows the same bell schedule every day. The day starts at 8 a.m. and ends at 2.50 p.m. Similar to the high school schedule, each period of instruction includes approximately half of the period in synchronous learning with their teacher and class, and the other half in asynchronous or independent work time. Students will also have an opportunity to access teachers and help for help and support. The middle school structure already allows for daily professional collaboration, so there will be no early dismissal or late arrival for our students at this level. Students will need to report in for each period every day. At the elementary level, students will start their day at 8.15 in the morning and end at 2.30 with a daily closure with, and that will be live with their teacher in class. Throughout the day, students will engage in approximately 30 minutes of live synchronous time with the teacher per subject for math, literacy, science, social studies, and specials and approximately 30 minutes for independent or asynchronous work. The balance of live synchronous time with the teacher and independent asynchronous work will be adjusted by grade level to ensure timeframes are developmentally appropriate. On Mondays, the student's schedule will be from 8.15 to 1.30 p.m. This shift in end time will allow for professional collaboration on a weekly basis as staff prepares for e-learning instruction. Our early childhood students in our half day and extended day programs will begin their day and their typical time. Similar to elementary students will start the day and end the day with class meetings, building a positive class community. Throughout the day, students will engage in live whole group small group and individual sessions with educators focused on social emotional learning, early literacy, early numeracy, and parent education. Instruction will have a healthy balance of live synchronous, recorded videos, and asynchronous sessions and provide for parent partnership opportunities. This slide shows an example of a connection student set schedule. To begin the day, our Connection students will meet with their advisory class for a live synchronous session focused on social emotional skills and communication. Students will then follow their normal schedule with first period beginning at 9, 10 a.m. and fourth period ending at 2.30 p.m. During each period of instruction, there will be approximately 30 minutes of synchronous time with their teacher and class and approximately 30 minutes of asynchronous or independent work time. Our goal after the first six weeks of school is to move to stage two, which is our enhanced e-learning model. This model builds off of our full e-learning model. However, some in this stage will begin to, to transition back into our buildings for small group or individual learning. Students will continue to participate in learning through an online environment with their set schedules. However, staff will begin in-person learning experiences for priority groups of students. This may mean a student coming to the building in small groups to engage with a teacher or complete an assessment, or it may mean a student could be asked to attend an in-person class in order to complete a lab or hands-on component of a course. An example might be students who need to see the reading specialist or math specialist, students in driver's education who need behind the wheel practice, students who may need to participate in a live lab session, or students who need in-person teacher support. 
this might also be the time when we bring in our primary students to become acclimated into the school environment by visiting classrooms and buildings. In-person learning will take place for targeted groups of students. We will prioritize our students with IEPs, English learners, and preschool students as we enter into this phase. Starting out with smaller groups will help us assess our processes and procedures as we increase the number of students in the buildings during this phase. It is important to note that e-learning continues for those who originally selected online academy. Extracurricular activities will continue in person or virtually as guidance allows. Hybrid learning is a term we introduced in our July plan. We will continue to offer hybrid learning during stage three of our plan. This will allow students to spend a balanced amount of time in an e-learning model and in-person instruction. We will systemically increase the amount of in-person instruction during this stage. Students will begin to establish in-person connections with teachers and peers in the physical classroom space. This will be done in increasing amounts of time while we evaluate what is working and looking for ways to increase in-person instruction for all students. In this stage, it will be important for students to form in-person relationships and classroom culture in the physical classroom space. We anticipate about 50% of students attend in-person Tuesday through Friday, provided the space and guidance allows us to transition. Mondays will continue to be an e-learning day for EC12 students. Under the current guidelines, we do not anticipate having enough space for students to eat lunch at high school and junior high school, resulting in the need to possibly shorten these hybrid days. Taking into consideration the anecdotal experiences learned and observed during our stage two transition will help us inform the hybrid process and protocols as we move to this stage. Students and families who elect to continue in an e-learning format will have that opportunity. Stage four of in-person learning brings us back to our normal school structures and processes. Given the guidelines that we have currently in place, we anticipate this will not transition here until we are in phase five of the Restore Illinois plan. This stage resembles our school environments prior to this global pandemic. This is when we return fully to in-person daily instruction in the school building. All activities, clubs and sports resume all in person, meetings, practices and games. The full e-learning would become folded into our normal school structures with all students also returning to in-person learning. We will continue to offer our normal high school blended at online courses during this stage as we have always run those under our normal course offerings. From an assessment perspective, teachers will continue to administer their PLC or teacher created formative assessments designed to target areas of growth and challenge for our students. As we move through the stages and begin to bring targeted students into buildings, students in grades kindergarten through eighth grade will be administered the NWE Math Growth, Reading and Mathematics Assessment at their home school. Additionally, students in third grade will participate in COGAD assessments to support the identification of students ready for placement into our Honors Mathematics program. Specific dates for these assessments will be determined based on, on the school readiness to return to larger groups. Lastly, seniors will participate in the College Board SAT in September and juniors will participate in the College Board PSAT and MSQT in October. Both will be at their home school. It's important to note that these dates cannot be changed due to the requirements of the College Board and will occur while we are in stage one e-learning for all. IEPs will be provided, IEP services will be provided to students during all stages of the return to learn plan. Just like there are large differences in how e-learning will look compared to remote learning from the spring, the same holds true for our special education services. In the spring, we were required to reduce the scope of our IEP services in order to align with the state Board of Ed's mandated reduction in grade level standards and instructional minutes for all students. As of today, the State Board of Education has stated that students must engage in five hours of instruction or learning activities each day. 
Based on this requirement, we do not anticipate making any significant changes to IEP goals or services. However, some minor adjustments may need to be made to how IEP goals are addressed based upon the learning environment and or our ability to maintain the health and safety guidelines established by the Illinois State Board of Health. We recognize that for some of our students receiving services, asynchronous and online learning works well for them, while for others, this may not be the case. During the first six weeks, IEP teams will determine the progress each student has made towards their IEP goals, progress during remote and e-learning, and input and feedback from family members and make a recommendation for how to support that student moving forward. While all students will begin the school year in an e-learning environment, priority for in-person instruction will be given to those students who were greatly impacted by the remote learning last spring and anticipate that some students will begin this transition during stage one. As with students with IEPs, all 504 and English language services will be provided to eligible students throughout all stages of the return to learn plan. Students with 504 plans will receive the accommodations and services identified in their plans to help ensure that they are able to access their grade level, grade level curriculum in the same manner as their peers. English, English language services will be provided in collaboration with grade level or content teacher to ensure that English learners can engage meaningfully in the curriculum, as well as increase their English language proficiency. New students who have not already been screened for services will be contacted no later than 30 days after the start of the school year to come into their home school for an assessment. I'm happy to share that from March 16th to July 29th, we have, till July 29th, we have served 34,978 meals. We will continue with our current plan until August 31st, which allows for any student to pick up breakfast or lunches regardless of their free and reduced lunch status. Beginning on September 1st, we will have new procedures for our meal plan. We are anticipating the USDA and is to release new guidance by mid-August. We are hopeful that we will be able to continue to provide meals to any student in need, but we'll certainly be able to continue providing meals to our students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. As we have done since March, we will continue to provide those grab and go meals. We are, in, oops, I'm sorry. We will be partnering with the YMCA and Champions to provide on site childcare to assist District 203 parents of elementary age students who may need childcare between the hours of 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. This partnership will continue until our schools are able to return to full in person learning. For those families who require childcare for their ele elementary child during our e-learning and hybrid stages, details such as schedules, pricing, and financial assistance will be posted on our website in the upcoming days. Tonight, a message will go out to parents outlining this presentation. As more information becomes available, parents will receive Talk 203 messages from both the district and their student school. We'll also be updating our website to reflect this change. It is very important that our families check their email regularly as we, we will be sending updates over the coming month. I cannot stress enough the fact that this is a fluid, ever evolving process. As stated in the beginning of this presentation, our ultimate goal is for all students and staff to return to full in-person learning. Our number one commitment is to keep all people in our organization safe and healthy, while modeling and staying grounded in our district mission. This is an extremely difficult decision that I take seriously and was reached based on many considerations. I recognize this might not be, or I recognize this might be welcome news for some of our families, but others will find this decision disappointing. Our primary goal continues to be to develop and implement a plan that can be flexible and responsive to changing conditions of the pandemic and ultimately return to full in-person instruction. As I said at the beginning of this presentation, we know that an exemplary school district is the result of the collaboration among students, staff, parents, and community. And I'm asking that we all commit and unite to make the 2020-21 school year successful for all. I am confident that we will continue to provide the exemplary teaching, learning, and social experience for our students that our community demands while providing a safe, healthy environment and transition for students and staff. I will continue to update you as this evolves. At this time, my team would be happy to answer any questions from the board. 
Thank you so much for your presentation and for your tireless work with you and your team to um, develop the initial guidelines and to revise them and, and detail them for us here. I know that the board has numerous questions. Um, one of the things that we have done with a lot of those public comments and emails is put those questions into our questions for you. Um, so I, I'm gonna go through the process that we used in our last board meeting. Each board member can do three questions and then we'll go to the next person and then we'll go back and start again. And Donna and I as board leadership will wait until the rest of the board has asked their first round of questions and then we'll do ours. Okay, so I will recognize the first board member for questions. Who do I have? Joe, I see you first. Yeah, first I wanna uh, thank you and, and your whole team for uh, putting this, this plan together. Uh, a lot of work has gone into it and this is just a, a really challenging uh, situation. Um, you know, there's no textbook solution. Um, there's no solution that's going to, to satisfy everybody. Uh, I know my kids were excited to get back to school too in person um, and you know, hope we can do that uh, as soon as possible. Um, but as an educator myself, I'm as I'm preparing for going back in a hybrid mode, I'm seeing the challenges of that in-person component. And I think this is a, a prudent approach um, in the pandemic. Uh, it's really a, a good way to incrementally look at how things are going. Um, I do have a number of questions uh, about it. Um, first, um, as we said, th this is going to be a challenge for a lot of families um, to have to uh, accommodate uh, fully uh, remote learning. Um, and I worry about families who have no internet or unstable internet. Uh, families uh, where, where it's hard to find a learning environment that's really conducive for, um, for education. Um, families where all the parents are working outside the home. Uh, I know there are childcare um, solutions that are, are uh, being worked out, um, but, but these are uh, equity things that we have to think about. And um, the, the plan gives a, a nice regular schedule. It gets kids back into a routine. Um, but I guess the other side is um, how is there going to be flexibility um, for families in, in many different situations uh, right now, um, you know, who may have kids in, in child care and they have to log on at those times. Are we working with those child care providers? Um, you know, it's just a, a very, you know, challenging, um, uh, puzzle, I guess, to uh, have the routine, but also have that um, you know, equity. Uh, equity um, you know, when kids might not be able to log in immediately at the beginning of every class, and they may need, you know, some of the lessons uh, recorded and, and come back to them later, or things like that. Um, how will families be worked with to understand their individual situations? Thank you for that question. And, and you know, I don't think there's one one single answer <laughs> to the question that, that you raised. Uh, I'll, I'll begin simply by saying equity uh, and access is going to be at the forefront of all of the work that we do. Uh, we recognize that as we move through this process again, kind of without a, uh, you know, without script or playbook or, or knowing exactly what our challenges are going to be in, in this new world, we, we must be flexible. We must be willing to adapt uh, and rethink some of our plans. Um, as, uh, as Willard uh, mentioned during uh, the, even the initial stage, our administrative staff at a minimum will be at our buildings, we'll be able to communicate with families as necessary, uh, you know, in terms of assessing student engagement uh, through use of administrators, counselors, as well as teachers uh, and other administrators will be able to, uh, you know, make contact and identify what the needs are and then be able to problem solve and, and think uh, through complex problems to be able to try to solve solutions to make sure that this works for for our kids. So again, not one specific, I mean, in terms of, and then also I just saw think about our partner uh, child care providers. We will certainly, uh, Chuck Freund has been uh, in contact with them. They'll be aware of our schedule and our expectations. Uh, and we can work on communication to other providers so that they're aware of our timeline and expectations as well. Um, I'm not sure if anybody in the team has anything to add to that, but uh, certainly equity and access is gonna be an important uh, uh, 
uh, for us throughout this whole process. The Jane? only thing that I'll add, the only thing I'll add is your question earlier, Joe, about access with wire wireless. Um, our IT department worked very, very diligently at the end of last year to ensure that we had um, connectivity for all students. We will continue to do that in the form of wireless um, access and devices. And, and thank you to the board that last week or our last meeting, we, we moved forward with the iPads for our um, ECK1 learners. So that will help connectivity as well. So IT is aware on it and we have a plan to make sure that everyone has wireless and that we know how to reach out to families and let them know um, that we have that available for them. Great, thank you. Um, and then last meeting, um, you discussed how you know, teachers have already started meeting to pass along information about where students uh, finished the school year, uh, helping to make that transition to the next school year. Um, and now that everything is online and there won't be any of those uh, individual face-to-face -face meetings, um, you know, how are we going to address that additional uh, summer learning loss? Um, how are we going to implement the uh, multi-tiered system of support so that the, the child's academic, mental health, social, emotional needs and uh, everything will be assessed and um, you know, we'll be able to provide that extra support uh, during the e-learning process to close any gaps um, that have developed. So this summer, our teachers worked together to identify students um, who were not engaged and students that did not uh, were not proficient with the, those essential standards. And as they met, they also developed assessments, but not necessarily just in-person assessments, assessments that, that also can be um, administered um, in an e-learning environment, anticipating that that might be something that would hap have to happen. Um, as Dr. Igo also shared, we will um, create structures to, for us to, as soon as we as possible, um, to get our uh, K-8 students in person to do some map testing on them. Um, so we'll rely both on our, um, our curriculum assessments that our teachers have created, and then also that map data. But um, we need to understand what, what um, the data first tells us. Um, not assuming that we have all learning loss, but we need to have the data that shows us what it is. And then um, our teachers, of course, as, as they always do at the beginning of every year, will adjust instruction to meet those um, needs of students and to um, go forward with that learning. I just would add one thing, I, especially in that elementary schedule, we have built in a specific time every day for the teacher to do some of that um, to have some small group or in person or help catch catch up. So I think it's going to be a balance of us really understanding where kids are, but then using some of those structures to make sure we provide that extra support. And I guess it's not just the academic side, but also the the mental health, social, emotional side. Um, you know, stress, anxiety. Um, you know, all those sorts of things. Will there be? Um, you know, social workers, psychologists, uh, you know, it, the, the, kind of the whole staff there to work with the, the kids. Absolutely. Online. Certainly, if we find a student that is experiencing things outside of the norm, we will definitely work to um, enroll, enroll our counselors or our social worker, or our psychologist. Um, you know, of course, that first starts in that classroom and really making sure that they've built an environment where the student feels heard, seen, and is trusted. And so by that, by the teachers, so that's going to be our first line, but certainly Anybody who needs more can certainly tap our, our we'll, we'll tap into those resources of social workers, counselors, or sites. Thanks. Uh, I'll come back to other questions later. Okay. I see Janet. Thank you. Um, could we, maybe if we can um, go back to slide 12 for a second. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I have, um, that sometimes I struggle with, especially, um, you know, and where I could see maybe others would is, um, you know, these these very specialized terms that we use. Um, and, and here, I think we're trying to break down e-learning versus um, remote learning. I, I think it'd be helpful to just go into that just a little bit more to just to make sure that, because I know people use those terms uh, interchangeably oftentimes. Um, I think it'd be helpful to just 
talk about e-learning versus remote learning and really, you know, what were, and if you could talk about what were some of the requirements that were imposed upon us back in the spring that, um, you know, limited what we were able to do and, and why you think in the fall without those limitations, the, um, the mm -hmm. online experience is gonna be better for, for our students. <laughs> So when we first started um, um, on March, I believe it was 18th, maybe that Monday, we started in an e-learning um, environment. And that e-learning um, structure is something that was approved by the State Board of Education. And e-learning had to resemble the traditional school day. Um, when our students first entered that learning, um, they had five hours of instruction. They followed a typical um, period day and that we could introduce new learning concepts um, and uh, followed our own grading practices and instructional practices. Two weeks later, the governor came um, and uh, determined the schools uh, you know, would close until early April. And at that time, the Illinois State Board of Education gave us guidelines for remote learning. What that did at that time is it changed our instructional minutes. They significantly decreased our instructional minutes um, that were required. Um, they waived some graduation requirements. Also um, recommending that we do not penalize any student for um, not um, engaging um, prior anything further than that March 13th. So they were, they were not negatively impact, impacted their grades since this was nothing that we had um, anticipated or prepared for. So it significantly is different because when we move forward now and implement an e-learning model, we have reinstated the five hours of instruction. ILSB guidelines also has um, recommended that we have two and a half hours of live instruction um, per day. So we know that our community um, gave us feedback that they wanted more live instruction, more synchronous, I'll call um, instruction between students and teachers. Our e-learning model will have that in there. It also will follow our own grading um, guidelines. Um, if you recall in our EC8 environment, we did not um, follow our grading practices and our reporting um, practices, and we will get to now reinstate all of those practices again. So that is that is definitely some significant differences between remote and what our e-learning plan will um, look like in the fall and moving forward. Please let me know if I did not answer all your questions, Janet. No, I, I think that was very helpful. I, I do think, um, you know, I, I think uh, it'd be helpful for for you all to tell us and to tell you know parents like how how would you like feedback if if you think if if we think the the rigor still isn't there, what's what's the best best way to provide that? I think the best way is how we do that even today. You know, well, we start with that classroom teacher. You know, if parents have questions, they reach out to the classroom teacher, um, and and go there first because the classroom teacher is the closest person to the student and the instruction that's happening in that classroom. Okay. And um, since I have three questions, I'm going to ask one more related to childcare options. So, so I think we said a full day, basically from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. So, so within that time, um, is it, uh, will, will YMCA and Champions essentially be there to help guide students through, through e-learning? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in there because I've been working with YMCA and, and Champions. Um, Janet, they'll, they'll be there um, to, to provide assistance just like they do with homework after school in a typical school year. Um, they're not there as teachers, um, but with our um, increased synchronous activity between teachers and students during the school day, uh, there really shouldn't be that need that maybe parents would have experienced back in remote learning in April and May. Um, but the staff will be equipped to to know kind of what the schedule looks like and and assist students um, like like a parent might um, from from home. Okay, thank you. Okay, I can't see anybody else's questions because okay, there we go. Okay, great. I see Paul. Sorry. 
when I hear the numbers of synchronous hours that you're committing to, and I divide by the number of classes a student takes in a day, I come up with around 20 or so minutes per class of synchronous learning. That number sounds very low to me. Could you, dis could you discuss why that number is so much less than what we would normally deliver uh, during a normal academic year and explain those trade-offs so we so that we can understand it better and hopefully embrace it. Sure, Paul, I'm going to begin and then I'll ask uh, Jane or, or Christine to, to kind of add on to it. First of all, the two and a half hour uh, minimum guideline guidance is provided by the State Board of Education. And I think it is responsive to feedback that communities and school districts heard about the importance of more live in-person instruction. And then when you think about instruction during a day. Uh, not every class, not every lesson is 50 minutes of direct instruction uh, being facilitated or led by the classroom teacher. You, you'll see a combination, or you'll see a mixture of that. And, and the two and a half hours or the 20 to 25 minutes per class is not a limit. Uh, it, it, there could be experiences of full period synchronous instruction depending on the lesson, what the appropriate instructional model is. So it could vary, but what we're saying is that in our model, uh, we're we're going to use the Illinois State Board of Education guidance of so two and a half hours of a minimum of synchronous learning during the, a day. The schedule that we had in the presentation is a sample schedule of, of how the day could look. Jane or Christine, I'm not sure if there's uh, more you'd like to add to that. I'm, I'm going to add a little bit that even when I, a student, let's say for high school, might be during a class period, some of that asynchronous time could be group work. And that often happens within our classes where a teacher facilitates half the time and then break out into group work. Then when we look at some of our youngest learners and we think about a first grader being in synchronous live instruction in a, on a computer all day is a little bit different than being active in a classroom. So we have to balance that developmentally by levels. And like Mr. Bridges said, it definitely depends on the course, the age of the student, but at least there will be two and a half hours of that live synchronous, but that does not mean students won't be engaged with other students and possibly even during that time of the asynchronous, a teacher's taking a small group of students and working with them as well. So our teachers will be working the whole time, um, but that live instruction may just not happen for the full 50 minutes of that class period. Thank you. Did you have another question or just that one? Okay. All right. So I will go to Christine. I saw her hand. I am. Um, can you talk a little bit more in depth about the special ed kids? Um, I'm concerned about how they're going to get their services that are outlined in their IEPs and 504s. I mean, we know that those kids need those extra minutes of, you know, the different therapies or, you know, just one on one time. Um, can you explain a little bit of how that's going to look and, and how we're going to really make sure those kids don't fall behind? Sure. Um, so I think, um, again, in the spring, we have to keep in mind that we were working. We only had every child for about two, two and a half hours, and we had to do English, math, and all of our services, which is why we had to make some decisions about where will we place those services and where are we going to put our, how are we going to support kids? Um, but our our um, special education staff is going to look at each and every kid individually and really think about and take into consideration where were they when they left us? Where are they now? Um, what feedback do the parents have? How did they respond um, during both remote e-learning if they happen to participate in summer school? All of those pieces. And then they're going to make some recommendations about. So based upon that, what we know about how they did and how they responded, here's how we're going to provide services kind of moving forward. Um, and I anticipate that we're gonna to start to prioritize those kiddos as coming in first. And we may have kids that are coming in and, and receiving some of that live instruction. I will tell you, I had a lot of parents, we were able to do some virtual where we did some live teaching that really went well. So you might see some more of that as well. We're gonna to have to balance that out with what was working for that student and what is hap you know, and how that fits into where we're, we need that student to move going forward. 
Is there going to be any kind of additional help kind of back to Joe's point about, well, I think even Janet, we've all, we all have it with the working families. So when you reference, you know, working with the parents, but if those parents can't be home, you know, I think about maybe the kids who are being, um, you know, they'll be with the YMCA or with champions, you know, maybe that goes back to, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, when I said working, hearing from parents, I didn't mean for them to be doing any, but to get their feedback of, here's what I'm seeing from my child. Here's what worked for us. Here's what didn't work for us so that we can, we can take all of that into account when we're thinking about how do we make a plan for moving forward. For some kids, we might have to adjust our services. Maybe we need to give more than we would have normally have given. We might find that some kids did just fine. We're just, it's hard for us to know where we're going to find our students exactly. Okay. Um, I guess the other question, this is a little bit more general, um, not to special ed, but I know the elementary schedule sample and the high school sample showed the extra collaboration time for um, teachers. Junior high is okay where they're at based on how yeah, the junior high structure already has two built-in PLC periods okay. um, per day. So we feel that that's adequate for um, the collaboration needed at that level. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Charles? Apologies for taking me a moment to get off of mute. So um, um, I'd like to go back to, and this has been brought up a couple times, so I don't mean to, to kind of harp on it, but I will tell you that, um, you know, one of my main concerns remains the, the, the supporting our parents and, and based on the emails we've gotten and things like that, first of all, I want to applaud uh, the team for really taking into consideration the new guidelines, guidance that continues to evolve, but at the same time, um, trying to take in as much of the uh, feedback and address as much of the feedback that we've seen from the parents. And it really has run the full gamut. And so I, I, I applaud the, um, the, the, the team, Dan, you and your team for for coming up with plans to, to meet the, the guidelines that, that, are, that are being provided, but at the same time, trying to incorporate as much of the feedback from the parents. The one thing that I continue to be concerned about, and Joe brought it up, Janet brought it up, um, uh, Christine brought it up a little bit even well, is to, how do we support those parents who absolutely positively need to work? And I know we talked about um, elementary from um, the champions in the YMCA. A couple of questions on that. One is really, is this essentially being able to provide that full day? Is it just certain times of the day? But is it intended to be able to provide that support during the hours of instruction? Because um, you mentioned for elementary students, so that's part A. Part B is, are there options for anybody who is outside of elementary age, maybe creeping into junior high? Because you know, while part of our mission is to educate students to be self-directed learners, not all of them are necessarily at that level by the time they hit sixth grade. So I just wanted to understand if there's any consideration for options that extend beyond elementary school. Okay, so Chuck, you wanna begin by talking a little bit about our, our current plans with the Y and Champions? Um, sure, and Charles, forgive me if I'm not, not getting at your question, but um, so specific to elementary students, um, the, the schedule uh, options, so to speak, that'll be available to families would be from 7 a.m. Uh, to 2.30 p.m. Uh, or, and they can also add on from 2.30 till six o'clock, uh, similar to a, a typical school year. And, and during that time, uh, during the school hour times, that is, uh, students would be likely grouped um, at their home school um, and um, in grade levels so that support could be provided uh, based on a typical schedule for, you know, i.e. a second grader or what have you. Um, We'd also look to, to provide some, some connection for that staff. We've talked about some professional learning at the beginning of the year for the YMCA and champion staff so that they're kind of in the loop on how e-learning will operate and what the expectations for our students will be, how students can, can seek assistance uh, if, they, if they require it throughout the school day, particularly during those asynchronous independent learning times um, so that uh, the, the staff that's, that's there can can direct students as opposed to being the primary um, supporter, if you will. Was that, did that, did yeah. that get at your question? Okay. Uh, and I'm simply gonna add on top of that is that, you know, again, you know, to, to some of the comments earlier, and I, 
these are tough times. These are unprecedented times. And we are all facing a number of challenges. Uh, We are doing our best uh, to try to identify what those challenges are. And and you have hit it right on the head. That is one of the biggest challenges uh, by by going to to beginning with this fully online model. We recognize that. And through cooperation with our partners, like the like champions and like the why we're trying to, to to solve as many of those problems or address as many of those problems as possible. What is going to be critical uh, throughout this is communication between, you know, the the teacher and the the, the parent, the the parent and the administration. Try to problem solve together, uh, and our teachers as well as our administration and other educators will work very hard to identify students who are not engaged or struggling with engagement. So we can get to the root of what the problem is. Try to create solutions to those problems. But it's going to be a challenge for all of us, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, no, I completely understand. Um, Now, the second part of my question was, uh, we're talking about elementary. Is there any opportunities beyond that? Have we have we evaluated anything there? To talk kind of to talk, uh, you know, just pretty openly about this, we, we do have some you know, one of the one of the barriers or one of the challenges will be staffing. So for child care, uh, we don't know yet what the need will be. Uh, we know that in our in our summer survey, about 25 percent of families, um, you know, informed us that they would anticipate some need for child care if we didn't return to in-person instruction. And, and um, you know, we'll have space. Right. Our schools will have space with, um, you know, within the e-learning sort of stage that we're starting the school year with, but uh, YMCA and Champion staffing, um, you know, we, we have to make sure we can, we can fit that need. And so we have not at this time uh, looked beyond the elementary age, uh, you know, age level. Okay. So then am I to understand that based on, again, estimates, and again, these things are fluid. So based on the information you just expressed, um, Right now, we're not looking at junior high, but even within the elementary, do we believe that based on our current understanding of capacity we would have, we would be able to accommodate, um, you know, I don't say all, but all that we anticipate based on the information we have, the uh, elementary uh, parents who might need that service? Yeah, based on the information we have, we believe we'll be able to staff to to that need, um, assuming that our, our families that have that as an essential need um, you know, register and, and, and not beyond that. Okay. And I will uh, just ask the question because of, because of what you just stressed there, essential need. Um, how are we defining essential? Is there a, a, like a, you know, what's the definition of essential? Yeah. I, I, as we talk about it with our childcare providers, we're, we're really talking about those families that that require it so that you know uh, the parents, the guardians can can work during that school day. Okay, all right. I think I've expired my three questions for now. So, thank you. I appreciate your uh, your answers. Okay, I'm going to go to Donna next because Donna and I will be our last of this first round, and then we'll start our second round of questions. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Dan and your team of administrators that worked an enormous amount of hours to develop a plan and then have to adapt that. Uh, with new guidance just that came out last week. I also appreciate, Dan, your commitment to communicate to our community. You said um, in one of your early emails that you were going to communicate on Tuesdays and Fridays with updates, and you've done that. So I appreciate um, that as we've adapted to the state um, changes. Uh, These are difficult times for everyone, and change is so stressful and yet necessary so that we can be the best that we can be for our students, staff, and community. So I appreciate how fluid and flexible we've been um, I also appreciate, Dan, your honesty. Um, You said it again today. You said on July 13th that this is what the plan looks like uh, as of today. And we will have to continue to adapt to meet new um, Illinois Illinois Department of Public Health and ISBE guidelines. So thank you for that uh, to reminder too. Um, I have an extensive number of questions um, that will help clarify for me and some of the community uh, the direction we're taking, but uh, you're, you're, uh, presentation answered a lot of them, like my colleagues have answered a lot of them. Um, and by in no means, I don't want my my questions to indicate any lack of support um, for your for your plan. It's more just for clarification. So um, my first question revolves around IEPs as well. We've asked a little bit about the students with special needs, but um, I wanted to know specifically as we include in-person services for students that 
have goals that are better served um, and addressed in person. Um, is that gonna possibly happen prior to the first, to the end of the first six weeks? Are we looking, I know that we have this transition plan, but for our IEP students, 504 students, um, are those transitions possibly, or, or some of those services going to be served in person with before the end of the first six weeks? Yeah, there are definitely some students that we will prioritize um, for that, um, specifically kind of our specialized students, particularly wanting them to have the opportunity to come in, reacclimate to our buildings, understand what those new procedures are, help to teach them to learn to wear their masks, some of those um, health and safety things that we have, need to have in place. Um, but they will be kind of on our top priority. Um, and then we'll, as kids start to show need, we will certainly respond. So I know that I just, thank you. I know that I asked about the IEP students, but you also have in your stage one transition, I'm gonna focus on stage one for my yep. first few, or first three questions. You also have in your stage one transition, it says on one of your slides that um, we're gonna, uh, it says visit schools individually or in small groups to acclimate with building as necessary. And my question to you when I saw that on the slide was, um, who are we referring to here? Teachers, students, like who, who are we acclimating to the building in stage one? So sure, um, it, we're talking about acclimating our students to the building. Obviously it's teachers as well. We want teachers in buildings um, kind of intermittently to be able to do that. But in that statement, I believe that is under the student priorities. I don't have that one in front of me, um, but the purpose would be it's in the transition piece. That's oh, why. just in that transition it was really to focus in on students. So we might have an, a number of students, maybe right. kids who are entering kindergarten for the first time. We might bring small kids in to come in and just get a sense of what the building is. Those kids that are transitioning from fifth to sixth grade, identifying those kids in small groups to come in because a lot of our kids didn't get the opportunity to do kindergarten sneak peek or transition to kind of the the opportunity to walk buildings. So that was kind of what we're thinking, not necessarily for the purpose of ELA instruction, but how can we get you to the buildings? How can we make sure you know where you are, what you can expect, what it's gonna look like, um, both virtually and in person. Okay, so just to reiterate, this is my same question, I just wanna make sure. For okay. The but that's happening in stage one, though. Like we are getting students into yep. the building. So uh, I'm gonna, uh, if I can just, try, I'm gonna yep. answer this a little bit differently because I think, and, and maybe this will help with the community. I think we have this perception of the spring remote learning, where we shut down, our facilities mm -hmm. were closed, there was no access to it. That is different today. We are in a different place than where we are were in the spring. Not only programmatically, but in terms of where we are in the governor's plans. As you and the community are aware. We have a number of our students that are participating in co-curricular activities at our schools within phase four guidelines right now. So there will be opportunities in times for that acclimation um, in staff teaching perhaps from their classroom. So various things that can occur that looks much different than what remote learning looked like in the spring. Thank Great. you. Thank you for that. Cause I think that that really helps clarify for the uh, community too. Um, uh, my other question in regard to stage one is, and I think you started to address it, Dan, um, staff um, in the buildings during stage one, what, what is that going to look like? Um, are they teaching from home? Are they teaching from the buildings, both? What, how does that look? We're going to continue to work out some of that intermittently is how we've described it. Uh, there, there may be times within the day that uh, staff or parts of our staff or teams of our staff would have to be working. Uh, from the building or within their teams or teaching from their classrooms. We're still kind of working out some of those expectations. Okay. I think that was my three. I, I have a, a follow-up that's similar, but I'll wait and hold it. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for working on the question, you know, allowing us all to get questions in. We, that's a great way to do it so that everybody gets a chance. Um, and again, just echoing the, um, appreciation to the team and for going through these questions line by line that help our community to understand how their students' needs are going to be met um, in this new model. Um, I have a follow-up on child care. That's my first one. Um, I know that we have talked a little bit about um, the fact that this is a, an unanticipated burden for many and especially our, our families that were planning on the hybrid and then we've changed it and now there's additional child care needs. Just a question about financial assistance for families. And I know that we have um, 
you know, that we do certain things about that with regard to um, certain student groups, but just wondering how that will be addressed and if we can um, potentially even look at some of that CARES Act funds um, that we could assist ad additional families with the cost because many families aren't used to having to pay for that whole day. Like they would be able to have their um, students, you know, at school. And so it's, a, it's an additional financial burden that they haven't been expecting. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, um, so our, our YMCA and our champions, um, you know, partners are actually uh, pretty familiar with this because we've worked with them for several years now. Um, families uh, through the registration process, um, if financial assistance is something that they seek, um, would actually begin with the um, child care assistance program, uh, which is uh, under the CARES Act, in fact, um, through the Illinois Department of Human Services. Um, and, and so some families may actually um, uh, sort of qualify under, under those provisions. Um, if not, uh, both YMC and Champions uh, has provided scholarships over the years for us uh, in our agreement with them. Um, and we're also uh, working with uh, some other local agencies to beef up those uh, potential scholarship opportunities. Okay, great. I, I just think the more that we can communicate to our families about the assistance that's available, um, because, it, you know, for many families, this isn't a, a cost that they've had to have in their budgets until now. That's right. Um, okay, and I, I do know that there, it, I think we have some partners out there for junior high, um, people like Alive, etc. Could we potentially work with them to look at that junior high question for families that might just want a little supervision for their students so they're not home alone all day? Yeah, we, we um, certainly can look into that. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Um, next, can you talk a little bit more about the metrics of when we move from stage one to stage two and how that works? Jane, you wanna speak about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Sure. So first and foremost, we're going to have to look at what the Illinois Department of Public Health puts in front of us and also what ISBE guidelines um, state. So that's going to be at the forefront of everything that we do. Then we really are going to say and, and look at, um, you know, what, how are we doing in implementing our health and safety guidelines, especially as we start having some, you know, we have, lo we'll have lots of staff in the building um, in our stage one, but as we start increasing students into the building um, and, you know, how does that, you know, how are our processes and procedures um, bearing and, and can't, do we feel like we can take more students on um, and more and more people on in that? So we really have to look at the facilities, you know, can the facility facilities operationalize what we have in place and then can, you know, the human factor, how are the staff and how are students um, responding in our smaller groups as we build that? So again, just kind of adding to that and, and restating some of the, the significant things we'll look at, um, you know, in, in addition to what Jane said, our ability to uh, maintain inventory and, and refill uh, PPE supplies, uh, you know, across the district to ensure that we have the appropriate um, things in place. And again, the big thing is going to be the, the guidance that we get from the state uh, board, as well as the Illinois Department of Public Health. Uh, as well as DuPage County. And as I shared early, you know, DuPage County, we've seen an uptick, we've seen an increase and in, uh, most concerning about the age of 10 to 19. So it'll just be following local metrics and our ability to implement stage one effectively before we feel comfortable and confident moving to stage two. And you won't reevaluate for six weeks, right? So this is six weeks of stage one for sure. Or are you evaluating as we go through and thinking about making a transition within the six weeks? Sorry, I just want to make I want to be clear because I, I wasn't quite sure how that six weeks. Right. And, and so this is an answer that you you know that's it, it, it's fluid. <laughs> okay, we are planning for now for six weeks and our initial evaluation at six weeks. There could be changes in conditions or changes in metrics or changes in guidance that we get from the state board or the Illinois Department of Public Health that would require us to shift course at a different time. But our, our plan at this point is that six week time, kind of around the parent teacher conference time. And Kristen, we will be um, gathering information every week of the plan. So that will help us inform at that six week interval. Okay. 
Um, so I really appreciate the um, details in the presentation that talked a little bit about what necessitated the need for change, i.e. the um, guidelines that changed with regard to um, remote learning, you know, in terms of, you know, the fact that there's 2.5 synchronous hours that we hadn't planned for in our hybrid model and the ideas of the, the specific things about cafeteria and not being able to feed all the students there at the same time due to this new guidance, et cetera. So that helps us to understand some of the rationale for needing to make the change. I think one of the things that I keep hearing and that I'm very conscious of as a parent of my own three children is that this is a lot of loss for kids. This isn't what we would have planned. The loss is not only because of the fact that we're you know, not going back to school, but there's been a lot of loss for kids across the board because of the pandemic. Certainly in the early stages, but even now, as we think about, you know, a senior year that's totally different or, um, you know, that plan to go to kindergarten, all those different things are a lot of loss for kids. Can you tell me specifically how we, how we can really work to mitigate losses, both in stage one and in stage two? Yeah, I think we can, uh, I'll ask Christina to talk in just a second. I think stage one is really set up to try to mitigate those losses from the beginning and to really set a solid foundation uh, for uh, uh, a safe, not just safe from the physical standpoint, but safe from a mental health standpoint of a return to school. Remember, we abruptly left school in March uh, with, with the sense that school is not a safe place. Our plan in stage one allows us to really mitigate that perception and that that thinking to try to rebuild confidence. And again, as I said earlier, you know, our, we're not shut down. We're, we're approaching our instruction through a different model at this time, still allowing for engagement and participation. Uh, the, the instructional strategies that we have in place in terms of how we structure the day will allow for that social engagement between teachers and kids and, and kids among each other, um, structured as a part of the day. So, you know, I think this plan does recognize that loss. And as I said in my opening comments, you know, I've got a senior who was expecting a lot of things this year. So I try not to take things personally, but I'm taking this one personally because we've got to ensure that, you know, these kids have these opportunities. It's important. But I want to ensure that when we're back, we're back. Um, you know, and we set the foundation to be able to safely and smartly get our kids and our staff into our buildings so they can take advantage of those great things. What will be a challenge for us to continue to mitigate is the back and forth or, or not responsibly transitioning into the school year and perhaps seeing you know, what we've seen and we've heard about uh, summer camps in some states or in other places where kids and activities have, have come together. They've seen spikes in cases in the community and among the kids. And, and so we have to do this safely in a way to ensure that, you know what, when we're back, we're back and we feel confident about being there so that we can do those things. And I think stage one really lays a solid foundation to build strong, uh, you know, uh, buy-in by our kids, by our staff and our community to ensure that schools are safe. So Christine, I don't know if there's things that you'd like to add to that. Yeah, just one, I think you kind of hit on it, but really I think when we set this up, we really did approach it from how do we make sure we don't have to to go back as much as possible. And if we had started in hybrid and something had happened and we had to go to remote a couple weeks in, you know, that again, that's loss and that we're trying to help mitigate. So by being very slow and deliberate and carefully bringing kids back into school, we're hoping that we're able to mitigate the spread of the virus, therefore keeping kids in school and mitigating the loss that they, they've all experienced. We all have experienced in, in true honesty. And I, that, I really appreciate that. I, I agree one wholeheartedly that we have to do things safely. Absolutely. And that's what this these phases articulate is that safe plan. However, I think it's great to hear that um, as much as we can do that in stage one and stage two, um, we're going to lay that foundation for those safe experiences that um, are things that kids look forward to, you know, meeting their teacher in person, for example, in a small group would still be something that's really exciting for a, 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 a student. Um, and, and as we head to that stage two, also just thinking through like, to the extent that we can safely utilize outdoor space um, more, you know, whether that's in the extracurriculars in stage one, or even as we head into stage two, so that we are, our students are still able to have some of the experiences that they looked forward to, to the extent that we can accomplish them safely and not go backwards and that kind of thing. 
One other thing that I'd like to add as well, Kristen, you brought up, you know, at the end of the school year, we abruptly left and our kids over and over again heard it wasn't safe to be there. For our students at the beginning of the year to start in e-learning and to actually see their educators and their teachers, who is the closest thing to our students in the um, school environment, in a building um, safely, that helps reinsure our kids' safety. You know, they may tell us they feel safe going to school, but the last time they went there, we, we told them it wasn't. So if they see their teachers in their classrooms um, intermittently or when we get to uh, phase or stage two daily, that's going to be very reassuring for students of all ages, not just our little, um, our little ones. Agree, and and it, it's unquestionably going to be different, and so that you know that it will be uh, more challenging to develop that reassurance. So definitely, that the phased in um, does also give the time for that as well. Okay, those are my three questions. Um, I, I saw Paul's uh, hand the first, so we'll start with Paul again for the second round. Could you discuss District Two or Three transportation services, uh, you know, from the gamut, including what might be available for extracurriculars? through YMCA and Champions. Paul, I guess, uh, can I get a little bit more specifics in terms of what you're asking? Um, I guess what I'm asking is, will there be transportation services via District 203 buses, drivers, and so on, okay. available for parents to engage, whether it's for extracurriculars, uh, okay, okay, just confirming, thank you. care into YMCA and Champions and so on. So we are still in the process of working out some of the logistics and, and operational things ar around that, so I don't have anything to report this evening. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to move on to some other area, and that is moving into this, this new e-learning phase can we assume that the full spectrum of coursework will be available to all students, uh, net of something that's physically impossible? Uh, net of something that's physically impossible? Um, I, I'm pretty certain, yes. Um, you know, you gave a good examples. I just want to see, you know, uh, uh, driver's education is a great example. We can't provide behind the wheel instruction in, in, in without students present, you know. So, um, Jane, if there are there exceptions that we can address or otherwise, are, uh, we anticipate students uh, participating in courses as, as they've enrolled with some exceptions. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're, we plan on offering our comprehensive um, course just like other institutions would offer um, theirs online. Like I think right now as we are going and looking at what we can't, you know, Mr. Bridges just said, um, driver's ed, that's what we anticipate right now is really our only one that we can't offer. Um, uh, I will give an example of some of our um, education courses that we have in CT at high school. Normally we have, a, we run a preschool. We're going to do some virtual things. So our teachers are being creative. Um, we're giving teachers time to think through what does it look like and how do they adapt their instruction in e-learning environment. And we, we're fortunate to have amazing educators that are very creative um, to, to be able to meet those needs. Thank you, that fully answers my question. And in terms of the one that wasn't answered, are we gonna be addressing this next board meeting too? So for, I, I, I'm assuming yes, but I, well, it's just, I, I wanna put again, that on. I, I, again, I will go back to one of my opening comments. This is fluid and ever changing, and I am I am sure we'll be addressing this right up to the beginning of school. So yes, I anticipate we'll be updating you further at the August seventeenth meeting. Okay. So for anybody who has additional questions, we've still got that opportunity. Okay. Next, I see Janet. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I think a big part of this this staged. Um, plan is that 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 I, I think we, we want to make sure is not lost on on on. On, on us, on, on the community, is I, I think what it does is get students into school, but also keeps them there. And that, that, that keeping them there is, is so important. Um, but, you know, and we've talked, I think, conceptually about when students will be in school. And, um, you know, in, in, for example, stage one, we've talked conceptually about when that might happen. Can you, can you just help us make that a little bit more concrete? Like, give us some examples of where a student might be in school in stage one. 
Uh, I'll give a couple uh, first examples. Um, and then Jane, if you wanna give some, some others. Um, uh, seniors uh, to take the SAT uh, will be invited to come into our schools. Juniors for the PSAT uh, are two very, you know, very clear examples of offering national testing days that we don't have control over the, over the dates on. Uh, what might be some other, Christine, what might be another example uh, of kids being in the building? Sure, I would say for sure during stage one, you'll see a lot of our specialized students having the opportunity to come in, meet their teachers, get reacquainted re with the classroom or any student with an IEP that would have had that transition written in um, where they get to come in and preview the school and walk the school prior to coming. I ant fully anticipate seeing that happening in stage one. And can you talk a little bit about um, what what have we been doing to maybe prepare our, our teachers, our staff to be successful in e-learning? Jane. Yep. So over the course of actually the last six years, we've been heavily invested in professional learning around our digital learning initiative. So as soon as we implemented um, all of the Chromebooks within K or 212 and then our iPads, we have offered lots and lots of professional development. Um, three years ago, we implemented our blended learning courses and our online courses at our high school that also came with extensive um, professional learning in the area of blended and online coursework. And just since um, April, we have ran courses this summer that 130 educators um, uh, participated in, in preparing for online instruction. And then all of our professional learning um, prior to the start of September 1, first day of school, will be aligned to the stages. Um, just this week, we will be sending out some learning for all of our staff in the area of Canvas, because that will be an expectation that every teacher has a Canvas um, homepage okay. so that they can uh, communicate with students and staff or and parents and that it's consistent. So if I have a student at a junior high level and a student in elementary, I know that it's still the same learning management system. So our teachers will have um, professional learning in that application if that's something they're not already used to. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I see Charles. Hi, okay. Um, one of the things you mentioned during your presentation was that students will need to log in regularly, just for clarification, um, for the, at the high school level. Is that for each class or is that like once a day? What's, what's the thought there? And is it, is it random or is it literally for every class? Just want to get some clarification on what you meant. Sure, absolutely. So a little bit different. In remote learning, we had students that in the spring, they logged into a Google Doc. We're not going to be doing that any um, longer. What we'll do is instead of showing up in class in room 220, our students for period one, our students will show up in Zoom. And our teachers will see from our, they'll take attendance from the Zoom um, screen to see who's present, and then they will mark those students absent. Similarly to what I thought was a very big success in remote learning was that how we um, kept track of students. If we find out that a student has not engaged in, in our e-learning or is absent, let's say, for two days, we have a team that reaches out to that student and family to make sure to, to really find out why they're not engaged and how can we get them engaged. So that's a very important part of our e-learning plan. And that was actually one of our successful parts of our um, remote learning plan as well. Yeah, well, first of all, let me just say, I really appreciate that, the follow-up because, you know, one of the concerns is that students can, can find themselves becoming a little bit invisible in this kind of environment. So that level of follow-up or follow-through or requiring that checked in and then having a response planned for when people are checking in is something that um, I personally appreciate and, and really appreciate the fact that you guys thought that through. Um, yeah, so, so thank you for that. Um, the other thing is, so in a synchronous environment, just again, I'm trying to just anticipate questions in terms of what the flavor of what this will actually look like. Um, is it gonna be like, like again, like right now we're having an interactive conversation. I raise my hand, Kristen says, oh yeah, Charles, I see your hand. Is it going to be like that where there'll be a lot of interaction or is it, um, is that what's in, it encouraged? I know a lot of times when students are in in-person learning, a lot of times there's still that one-to-one -one, one -one dialogue 
with the benefit of the peers being able to hear the questions being asked is the thought to try to replicate that that environment yeah go ahead jane um, one thing that we have done is we have upgraded a district license to Zoom that allows for um, their teachers to do kind of what we're doing for sure. And also where we can have breakout sessions for different groups. So it's not that we are going to expect a student to sit in this environment the entire you know, time of the day, because that that's fatigue for anyone. So mm -hmm. it's, it's how do we structure, and this will be part of our professional learning, how do we effectively utilize Zoom or another um, in-person platform so that students get the face-to-face -face instruction with the teacher, but also with groups, and then also that one-to-one. -one. So that will be part of our professional learning. But yes, you could see it very similar to this, but it also might look a little bit different as we break out with students. Uh, and I'm, I'm only gonna add that again, we have to trust the professionalism of our staff and, and the skill of our staff to determine what the instructional methodology is best for the given lesson. So to say that there's one way that it's going to look or is there one recipe that we're trying to follow it is not right. There's gonna be some professional development for our staff to do what they do so well in a classroom through this new medium. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand and appreciate that. And uh, thank you for the comment and that. Um, I, again, I was just trying to get a sense of kind of what it would look like, not to try to prescribe a specific thing, but just, I was just using that as an example of what my mind is, is is of normal. Whatever other things look like, I just wanted to understand the range of flexibility that's in there, and it sounds like you built that in. So thank you. I'm done. That's my last question. Okay, got it. Okay, I see Joe, and then I'll go to Donna. I have to unmute. Um, so a couple of, uh, follow up questions. Um, I want to play off something that uh, Kristen asked about the transition back to phase or to uh, phase two, um, where we're looking at talking to, uh, you know, the, the state health department, the DuPage uh, health department. Uh, we have two schools in Will County and a number of residents in Will County. Uh, are we working with them as well? Um, and we, when I checked earlier today, um, they're in a different region, actually, COVID region than uh, DuPage, um, and their uh, positive test rates are uh, actually higher than DuPage right now. Um, so uh, are we you know, looking at all of that uh, health data as we're making that determination? Yes, yes, we are. And in addition, I'll, Christian, I'll let you speak in just a second. Um, there is work being done among uh, various health departments in the counties, the local health departments, to ensure that they are kind of consistent in their response to um, to this virus. Christine? Yeah, I would say generally speaking, we always go to the DuPage Health Department for all of our guidance, um, even for our two schools that are in Will County. Um, now this is a little different just because we're looking at different, different rates, but um, we'll take kind of our lead from DuPage County in terms of how we should respond and what this should look like um, and kind of making some of those decisions. Thank you. Um, and then in uh, the, the first stage, uh, there's a, a, about extracurriculars. Uh, it said that there would be you know, virtually or in person as kind of health and safety permit. Um, I would assume most would be virtual, uh, but could you give some examples of um, extracurriculars that might run in person? Well, we have a number of extracurriculars that uh, are running, for example, um, as allowed in, uh, under the uh, Illinois High School Association's um, uh, guidelines, <coughs> excuse me, that were approved and reviewed by the State Board of Education and the Department of Public Health. Uh, marching band and several of our, our, our athletic seasons are participating now uh, within guidelines that are established by them. So, you know, our, our team uh, under really under the direction of uh, Stephanie and, and Chuck at, at the various levels kind of walking through each of the things that we offer to determine what can be uh, offered and what it could look like. So there still be opportunities for you know different clubs and things to yes. be online, uh, virtual, you know, so students can interact outside of the classroom time as well. That's correct. Thank you. Um, and just one more um, 
Regarding the uh, lunches and things, um, I think it's great that we've uh, provided 34,000 meals uh, throughout the summer. Um, next school year, we were planning to include breakfast as well at the schools. Um, will breakfast be available in addition to lunch um, in the fall? I think it's my understanding that we were going to stick with breakfast just for the buildings that we had already started breakfast with. Is that correct, Chuck? Yeah, that's correct. And we're going to okay. we're stage breakfast in at a later time for the schools that haven't yet had that program, just because we just simply haven't had the capacity to build that up yet. Thank you. Okay. Are you done, Joe? Okay. I, I, I miss Christine and then I'll go to Donna. Sorry. I'll go to Christine first, then Donna, and then I'll Thanks, Kristen. Um, so when we were talking about the extracurriculars, um, some of the questions that we've seen or I've seen um, uh, from the community is in regards to like the performing arts kids. So is there, what are their opportunities as far as not just marching band, but your orchestra, your choirs, um, even your, your kids um, in theater, um, what opportunities do they have and are they part of uh, the group that could start seeing like the small groups coming in, um, maybe even rehearsing together in, in some ways. Um, I think, what is it in stage two, slowly like phase in some right. in-person instruction or where, where do they kind of fall? Because, um, yeah, you know, if the extracurriculars are being operated, this is, you know, regular curricular stuff for a lot of these kids. I fully understand. I actually have my own children who are fine arts kids. So I completely understand the, the passion that they have and the desire and the need to do this. But we need to move very cautiously with any kind of choir or any kind of band because they there's a lot of research that says that is where the, the disease is most likely to spread. And we have a lot of guidelines that we really need to be careful um, as we implement that. So that's not, I think we're kind of walking very slowly into into that that arena for that fine arts. And that's one example of why marching band has been allowed under under guidance is because it's outside, which is one of the recommendations. If band instruments are to be played, they one of the first recommendations, they should be played outside. I also want to add that this week, even just today, our performance music teachers got together to really think through what does their discipline look like in an e-learning environment. We have lots of new platforms um, that are very innovative and they and they know how to do it. And I think, I mean, they're, they've been amazing. We, over the last two weeks, have brought in lots of our kind of performance-based classroom teachers so they can tell us what's the best way for them to provide their instruction in this e-learning environment. And um, I think they're coming up with some really good ways that we will definitely communicate and articulate that to the community and to our students. Well, thanks for making sure. I, I didn't doubt it, but for to hear you say that you are in, including them, like they're the starting point of the conversation to see what their ideas are, what, what they may need to make this happen for our kids. I appreciate that. And then just going back to, this is just a comment. Um, when we've talked about coming back in slowly and getting kids acclimated to school being a safe, welcoming place again, I appreciate how we're trying to give the kids that consistency. I know as an adult, I'm a bit fatigued with the constantly shifting terrain. And so that we are really thinking about how to make these kids um, bring them into the environment so they can thrive um, just really goes um, it just goes to my heart at, at what we're all trying to accomplish here, that we want them back, we want them back safely, and we want them back um, full time, all the time, you know, this is where we want them, that that's where they belong. So I appreciate that um, very methodical, thoughtful approach. Okay, Donna. 
All right. And first, I want to thank all my colleagues for all their wonderful questions because, and I want to remind the community that as you hear um, all of us ask questions, we try very much not to um, repeat some of those questions. So I, I really appreciate that um, we're all taking turns. Um, but just know, community, please, that we we all have questions about IEP. We all have questions about um, the, how we're going to uh, be able to address the needs of some of the students that, that are in the biggest uh, gap kind of closing issues. So um, I just want everyone to know that we all have questions about extracurricular and arts and, you know, so I just want to remind us of that. Um, also, I just want to remind our community too that um, we have absolutely read um, our, you know, every email that has sent, every public comment that has been sent and are trying to address all of those in the midst of um, these questions. And I know we'll miss some and I apologize for that, but we're trying our best to make sure to be that liaison between the community and, and the administration. And thank you to the administration for all they've done. Um, so a couple of things, uh, a couple of my questions are um, a lot of people when we were, when we were in the midst of signing up for hybrid versus um, the online academy going back to our previous model, um, I heard from lots of people that they signed up for the hybrid um, reluctantly, like they didn't want to lose classes, but they also um, were like signing up with the hope that we would move to all online. Um, and so th there was lots of reluctance in um, some of the people who were appearing to support the hybrid model. So I, I believe there's a lot of still like uncomfort, you know, people uncomfortable out there. So as um, we're still talking about stage one, and families that are uncomfortable with some of these, we're talking about all these opportunities that they can move into the buildings in stage one and then into stage two. Um, and I know that they can still be fully remote. So how will that be addressed? Like how will families who are very uncomfortable having their student in the building at all be addressed during stage one and two when you offer those kindergartners a sneak peek you know, at the classroom or when you um, in stage two offer a science lab to be done inside the building or whatever it is, how, how are we gonna address the needs of those students who are gonna be in full, still remote? That's where our PLCs really come into play. Um, our, I think one of the beauties of our district is the collaboration among our teams. So I'll use your kindergarten example. Our kindergarten teachers would work together to think through what does this look like for in-person, but also how do we leverage technology to let's do a virtual walk for our kids um, using some of our camera technology so that our at-home kindergartners can also get a sneak peek of what is the reading corner look like? What does our LC look like? What does our music room look like and our music teacher? So that is something, um, for example, like the, the kindergarten. Then we think about, um, let's say labs, because um, I use that example, you know, I would assume that our teachers, um, as have been hearing their conversations, will videotape some of those because that's going to have to be some of the way in which they do it at the very beginning. Instead of having students come in to participate in those labs, they're going to have to work in their PLC to recreate a lab that students will have to observe and that they will have to report on. I mean, that, that's what's happening in our colleges right now is they have, you know, in some of our post-secondary, they have chemistry online and what, what kind of technology are they leveraging so that they can have those experiences. So our staff, they're very creative, they're very dedicated, and they will ensure that that will happen for both the in-person and for that online piece as well. That's where that equity comes in. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great idea, Jane. Just the, the collaboration among the staff is really gonna help drive what that looks like. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, also, when we were in the previous model, um, as a teacher myself, I, I thought, oh my gosh, these first few weeks are so important to like build relationship with the students. Um, and then it was, it was interesting because as I read through emails from teachers and, um, and had conversations with teachers. Um, and, I, and I truly thought that that in-person, those first few weeks were gonna be so important um, when we were in the hybrid model. Um, but then I, I had the understanding like, and in particular, I wanna thank the two teachers, two or three teachers who uh, reminded me that with that face covering, you, you can't see people's faces and the smile that teachers give. I mean, there's something small like that, the smile that teachers give students to reassure and to give them you know, the comfort level is gone. Like that piece is gone. And I didn't even occur to me. And then when you talked about um, 
being able to break out into groups, the cooperative groups that we can't do those in, in a hybrid model. We're going to have to do those in an, on, on an online model at this point. Can you, are, are there other um, areas that we can address that you thought through? Like I, that smile just hit me. It really hit my heart that like, we're, like as a teacher, I can't smile at my kids. That's, it's going to get me right now. Sorry. But are there other areas that we've, um, that, that we really feel like that, um, like this beginning online to me now seems so much more important um, as we moved into this and I wasn't there before, but now, you know, now I understand that. Is there something else you can help us with with that? So when we even think about how do we connect um, all of our kids. So in the hybrid model before we were in an A and B schedule. And so even having this e-learning, we now can see the entire community of learners from our second grade class and in our algebra one. So that that's a big one. Um, and I also think one thing that we, um, recognized and, and Dr. Igo brought this up when we brought our new educators in in July, that that's an exciting time for us. For us as administration, that's almost like the first day of school. Um, for us, when we think about our teachers, we bring them in in July, we meet them, we see them. It's as exciting as when we bring kids in. And to, to recognize that it just lacked that enthusiasm um, and the fact that everyone was kind of unsure on how to, how to engage with one another because we hadn't built the relationship first. And so by having our start be an e-learning start, we can take the masks off. We can have communications with the entire class. We see your smile, right? Um, our, our little kindergartners for the first time that they see their teacher, they see their teacher and actually sometimes with their mom right next to them this time, um, where before they would not have seen that, been able to do that because we could have not have had them in the classroom. So we do see the benefits. Um, and, and like you, Donna, I think we wanted so much to have that in person. I have three children within this district. We wanted that in person, but we just know socially, emotionally, the start in e-learning is best for everyone. Thank you for that because I, there were things I just hadn't like even thought about or realized, you know, because I haven't been in the building with, you know, with a mask on and social distancing at this, you know, it's so different from the teaching that I was in. Um, my last question then on this, on this round would be um, the concern of the parents that are, you know, like they are all in, they want to be there five days a week. And then this it seems like a step backwards for them. So um, I, I've heard concerns from um, people in emails that, you know, that the move into in-person is, you know, if we can't do it now, we're not going to be able to do it. That's kind of what we've heard. Um, I, I just think that this is almost like, and to correct me if I'm wrong and help me with this, I almost think this is like a zero depth pool where we're walking in gradually instead of just jumping in at the, at the deep end. Um, but that walking gradually is, um, is, is a movement that's gonna happen. I think we need to reassure some families that yes, we're definitely, I know we've said it, but I think we need to say it again and acknowledge that we have families out there who feel like we're gonna be stuck here. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. We want to return to in-person learning a, a, as quickly as we are able to do so. Um, you know, we, we are, this district is great at what it does uh, in terms of educating our kids, building relationships with kids, getting kids involved. We do that best when we are working personally with those students. We want our kids to be back in our school. And I think your analogy, the zero depth, well, I just, I drew the, the visual of, of Centennial Beach and the, and, and the quarry and walking into the zero depth part and eventually working your way across to the 15 foot deep end at the far east side of the, of the, of the quarry. And you jump in on that 15 feet right away and you're using every bit of energy you have to try to stay afloat Walking gradually, you move across gradually, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for that better success. So we Thank are you. committed to getting to that point, but um, we want to do it slowly, deliberately, and very intentionally with a thoughtful plan. Thank you for that, Dan. I appreciate it. Okay, so I have a couple questions about um, helping kids getting extra help. So uh, um, I know in the elementary level, we often have done um, sort of the before school camps where we at our, particularly at our title, title one school, where we bring in students a little bit early and we work with them. Um, and I know we often do like at the elementary lo level, those after school programs that are like just specific assistance 
um, where um, students get a little bit of extra help. I think we even do those at the junior high level. How are we conducting those? Are we doing that all virtually? Are we doing the early part? And then my second part of that is, and how about high school? So I know that they have all those structures that they even help each other. I can't remember the name of the thing that's before school where you go in and you have the peer tutors, but you know, just given that we can't, that we're not going into school, how are we facilitating all those for the various different levels, elementary, junior high, and high school with extra help? Stephanie, you wanna talk about the high school level? Sure, I can start with the high school first. Um, we ran, even in the spring, our peer tutoring group um, were able to set up Zooms and sign up students so that they could get some peer-to-peer -peer tutoring in some of the areas that they needed some support in. That will continue into the fall, as well as we have our structured study halls, so our assisted and supported study halls at the high school level and our tutorials. Um, so those will also continue to be a tier two support for our students moving forward, both the students we identified in the spring as having uh, issues and difficulty engaging and maintaining that mastery of standards, as well as um, the summer work through our PLCs where we further identified students who might need that initial support as we start in the fall. Jane? If for junior high, that'll be similar. So we will use some of our, I mean, we have our support staff, our strategic reading, our strategic math teachers that will um, access students during instruction and during their content, but also during that um, supervised study as well. So we'll utilize that time to support students. And actually just last week, Jefferson ran their jumpstart, brought students oh, good. into the building. Okay, yeah, was, is, good, okay. So, um, we tested kids, our buildings are safe. We can bring in some of our kids, small groups right now, right? Yeah. And so um, they, we brought in groups of kids. And then what does that look like after school? That's gonna be something that we're gonna work on with our leaders to say, once we feel um, to the point where we feel like we can start bringing students in, who are those students? We need some data on who those students are. Um, and then we also want to say, what is the structure for that? Um, we, you know, because they will have engaged all day um, virtually. And so what do we do in a face-to-face -face setting or maybe virtually for some of that support? And it'll be the same for the elementary as well. Okay, so we are considering even in stage one that some of that could be done in person. It could, it okay. could. We need to and, I, and I know that it's a similar process for staff as it is for students. Every, all of us as we head back in the building, need more time to um, do it successfully and, and be able to trust it and feel like it's gonna be safe and that we're gonna get in there and, it, and it, the, the protections are gonna protect. So I think that that slow process as well for, is for staff as well. And then we wanna be transparent that during that phase or the stage one, it, it will be for small groups. Small. It's going to be very small. Right. Um, we just wanna be transparent and we will build that up in our stage two. Um, second question, parents. So I know that um, that first six weeks of school, in addition to like reaching out if there's a concern, which you guys have already addressed that, there are some standard opportunities where parents get to meet the teacher and like, you know, hear a little bit about curriculum, those kinds of things, the back to school nights, the curriculum nights, et cetera. But that will definitely fall in stage one. And so I'm just wondering, have we envisioned how we will build and facilitate those relationships, even for parents, so that they feel more comfortable reaching out and saying, oh gosh, this isn't working or whatever, um, that, that can kind of build those relationships for parents too. We, we've definitely had some conversation about that in regards to um, just the, the health and safety that we really need to be thinking about how can we do that online yeah. and how do we bring people in to have those conversations um, in that same manner um, just to make sure we keep our buildings as safe as we can. I think Chuck wants to add to that. I, actually, you covered it pretty well. The, guide, the guidance right now that's out there is to really consider that virtually. Yeah. Um, so we, we need to we, we do need to focus in and talk with our principals about how that could actually look. And sorry, I didn't mean to suggest that it would be necessarily in person, but I just think that building of that relationship and the, you know, the opportunity for, for parents to do that as well, virtually is fine. I think that, you know, just as our students are, are doing the, um, uh, the, the building of relationships with their teachers, um, that opportunity for parents and just thinking through how that can be done, um, that's great. Um, okay, and then my last question is with regard to um, specific um, 
questions for college and career. So we have our counselors that normally work with our students on the high school level on a variety of different college and career things. Certainly for seniors, um, getting closer to those letter, letters of recommendation and the kinds of things that they need to do to really apply into those colleges and so that kind of finish up that four year college and career journey. Um, how are we gonna facilitate those individual um, conversations and signups and things that normally would go as a part of just running down to the counselor's office during the middle of the day? Yeah, I think it's pretty fair to say that that will look pretty similar in regards to instead of signing up to come into the office, I'm gonna sign up to have a virtual conversation so that I can have the things done that I need to get done. Um, our counselors will be continually sending things out to our seniors, reminding them what it is they need to be doing and where they need to go and reaching out to touch base with them. It'll just be more of a virtual touch base than an in-person touch base. And I assume, I don't, I didn't mean to suggest only seniors all the way across. Sure, of course it would be everybody, days. but yes. Right, yeah. okay. Be sure there's, that's, that's first and foremost on everyone's mind right now, for sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, um, okay. That's our second round of questions. Do board members have additional questions for a third round of questions? Okay, do I see anybody else here? Okay, I see Donna. I told you I had an enormous amount, I'm sorry. Um, so for um, high school, on our sample schedule, um, it says that we, you know, we've already talked about the two and a half hours of synchronous learning. Um, is that occurring on the, on the late start dates too on the Mondays? It could, um, it, it should. Um, two and a half hours is not a lot in a high school schedule. So um, we would assume that, that you know, our teachers would plan to meet those, to meet those minutes. And, and then also in high school, when we move to stage three and we're in the hybrid model, um, where, we, where it indicates um, that 50% of the students will be in person daily, um, is that including Mondays as well? I guess my question revolves around Mondays because it's a late start. Right now for Mondays, we are um, proposing that that would be an e-learning day um, for all, and it would remain that for the consistency and the planning um, for the hybrid model. Okay. And then um, my third question would be, um, so I know that we're supposed to, um, that we've, you know, community members have been directed to ask teachers questions, you know, as they have them, but I, I think we're still going to have a lot of community questions between now and the beginning of school. So where should they direct, what's the best place for them to direct those questions? Because um, we've tried to get a lot of them um, together here, but I'm sure we've missed some, unfortunately. Yeah, I believe the, be the best place uh, will be building principals. I'm going to ask that uh, the building administrators, uh, our community members who, yes, they may have questions, uh, give those administrators a little bit of grace uh, and us to work with them as, as they under see to understand uh, our, our plans moving forward uh, and, and specifically how to support kids. Um, and, and then also, but then to, uh, if it's an instructional question uh, to Mrs. Willard, if it's about a, a special education services, Dr. Rigo, general secondary, Mrs. Posey, general elementary, uh, Mr. Freund, and, and I think, you know, just uh, again, we'll ensure that the right person gets it. I also encourage anyone with a question regarding anything to do with the return to learn plan to use our talk, our Let's Talk platform, uh, that then we can ensure that the appropriate uh, school uh, representative uh, is given that question to respond. And then I know I, this is kind of a piggyback to that. So it's not my fourth question. It's just part of the third. I know there's a lot of community members who um, have sent in public comment that had specific questions. I mean, we had a lot of uh, support and we had some concerns, but then we specifically had, there was a group of people who, who had questions um, that were specific maybe to their student. Are those gonna all, I mean, I know there's a lot of public comment there and it's gonna take a while, but will those get addressed as well? Again, we'll go through those. Uh, we'll review uh, which questions we've addressed through the, the question and answer this evening, as well as our presentation uh, and, and ensure that somebody responds in a way of directing them where to find their answer. Uh, so it'll take, again, I appreciate you saying that, it's gonna take some time to go through those to determine who the best person will be to respond to, but we'll respond to those questions. Okay, I have more, but a couple more, but I'm almost done. So I'll just defer to whoever's next. I don't see anybody else that has questions on, on the hands except for myself. So I'll, I'll alternate with you and then I'll go back to you. Okay, so um, 
one question I had is um, in terms of, um, I know that you, I, I, Paul's question, it, it, it's piggyback on that, um, with regard to will you run all courses? And, and you pretty much gave the answer pretty much. Um, and so I'm just wondering if there are areas within those courses that we might have um, a reduction in course materials due to the fact that we are online, could we look at the fees for those courses? So if, for example, we are running ceramics, but we're not going to be in person with the ceramics for a while, um, might we look at, at reducing the fee there for that course so that we can, you know, give the relief that we're, we're just not going to, we're not going to have that same need for those supplies. Yes, we will, we will review that. Okay. And on a related note, if there are those that we just say, wow, we can't, driver's ed's not a good example, but if there were, for example, a high level lab course um, that we couldn't run because of the, um, you know, difficulty in bringing students in until later in the, in the semester, um, you know, we had several inquiries about the dual credit limit. So if, that, if that's something that we need to address policy-wise so that we could accommodate for those classes, if they were able to run safely um, in a dual credit environment, you know, just a, a note that, you know, if we need to look at that, that I'm certainly willing to have the board, I'm sure the board would be willing to look at that if you felt like that was a recommendation that needed to be made. We don't we, at this yeah. oh. Sorry. No, we, we don't, we, we don't believe at this. Don't okay. believe at this time that that's going to be something necessary. But we are certainly open to having that conversation if unique cir circumstances present themselves. That we that's the best way to problem solve and to take care of it. Okay, wonderful. Okay, um, next. You know, I know it seems crazy to start on the questions for stage three when we're you know we're we're here at stage one. At the same time. I think one of the things that I am appreciative about in terms of um, the slower approach is that um, we have other, we're not, you know, we've always, I've, I've heard this us often say that we don't want to be on the bleeding edge. We want to be on the leading edge. Um, and I just would, uh, uh, you know, really heartily uh, agree with that in this case that we didn't want to be on the bleeding edge, i.e. the very first school that went back to school and, you know, had very difficult times with quarantines and illnesses and lack of consistency of learning and those kinds of things. That being said, because there are some school districts that will be going forward with more in-person learning, whether it be hybrid or in-person than we are, just a note about could we just really stay in close communication with those districts so that we can learn from them so that when we are the leading edge, when we are that next district that's in, in um, that we're able to um, utilize their best practices for enforcement, whether that's on masks, whether it's on temperatures, whether it's all the different things that you mentioned as being so difficult, um, in, even if it's contact tracing and looking at um, you know, how different hybrid models worked with contact tracing and whether or not there were any particular um, better models in that regard. We have been collaborating with num districts throughout the nation, uh, throughout this whole process, and this is not gonna stop just because we're starting school now. Right. And I, and I know that and I just appreciate the efforts that you're able to make to continue that communication because it will benefit us. The fact that we are going in a little bit more slowly, um, you know, we can let them, you know, make some of the mistakes, perhaps, that we would that we're hoping to avoid um, and be able to really get in there and take those best practices um, when we're when we get to that stage. Um, I think that um, those are my questions at this time. Um, as Donna has said, I, I know that there are many um, individuals who have sent us numerous questions. And um, just a note for the um, continued willingness of um, the board and the district to continue to hear from our community and um, listen to those concerns. I know that as, as you had expressed in the very beginning of your comments, Dan, um, you know, we, we not everything went exactly perfectly. And as we you know, heard concerns from community members, they were able to be addressed. And that's something I'm really proud of in terms of, of the work that we were able to listen to the concerns and address the concerns. So um, just a, a, a hopeful note for the community that as you continue to have questions and concerns, I know that we'll be able to find answers to those questions and concerns. So um, we hope that you'll continue to send them on to the district and to the board. Okay, uh, Donna, you have more questions. Yep, just a couple more. Um, I, as we, um, I, just to piggyback off of Kristen's uh, comments, um, you know, lots of other districts uh, have also changed uh, their 
they're planning and are moving to a remote start as well. So I just want to note that for our community mm -hmm. that it's it's important to know that yes, we we do. I I so trust in this team um, and what you guys have done to plan. Um, and I think that you do lead because I think other districts then. Um, hear what we're doing and, and think about what we're doing and then they they also follow so I appreciate what we're doing and I just want people to know that other districts are in the process of shifting as well as our colleges uh, you know my college students are are having the same kinds of uh, changes happening at the very as new guidance comes out so thank you for following the new guidance um, I was very excited to hear um, I know we had some conversations about um, early childhood K kindergarten and first grade um, that we um, definitely have already acquired the one-to-one -one devices for them. So that's really very exciting as we move into that. So thank you for that. Um, in conjunction with that, have we, um, what are we doing in the way of supporting um, uh, those platforms then to be able to like, cause those require apps that require purchases. And um, uh, yeah, so that's my first question. What are we doing in, in regard to that? So let me just let me just begin before Jane addresses the more, the more specific part about the apps. I just want to make sure there's just a point of uh, uh, clarification. Make sure we're on the same page. We're in the process of acquiring those. Okay. Uh, they're not in hand, and it's our intent, uh, especially as we get into an agenda item later, pushing the start date date back to September one gives us more time to ensure that they're acquired and then apps are loaded and ready for use. Jane. Yeah, we already, because of our um, two-to-one environment, we already have and, and have identified apps in the, for those age levels um, that we use. So we will ensure that every single iPad, we've been working with Roger's team, um, that every single iPad that's distributed to our EC one and two students have all of the exact same applications on there that our students know and are used to. And we also know this is going to be new that we're gonna have to do some online modules for our parents um, and we might need to even do some in-person for our um, youngest primary kids to, so they know how to log on. We can't just assume once they have them in their hands, they know what to do with those. So we will be very intentional, not just on loading those machines, but in the area of um, teaching students how to use those machines. Okay, and then just to piggyback on that as a, as a a teacher too um, your teachers are so creative like you said and they're and they're always looking for new things to be able to to uh, make this the best that they can make it for um, online learning so as they um, the, the apps that they used in the classroom may very well be different than the apps that they use that they will be utilizing online so is there room for um, those kinds of uh, like, and is there a pro I mean, I'm sure there's a process, but is there room in the process for that if, if teachers find the need for additional resources? Yes, there absolutely is. We have a lot of resources. Um, and even this spring in remote, we tried to utilize the ones that we already have in place because especially with our youngest learners, we don't wanna overwhelm with too many. We wanna use our most effective and use those well, but we have a process that if our teachers um, come and, and as a group decide that they have found an application that works most effectively with students, we work with the IT team to add those to and push those out to all the devices. And then our teachers always teach our kids how to use those applications. Okay, and then my last K1 question is, um, I know how important the hands-on manipulatives are for students at that age. Um, how are we going to address that? Are there uh, kits that we're gonna get out to them or something like, how are we gonna address the hands-on um, manipulatives that those that so is a big part of what those two classrooms are are utilizing to teach those students. Again, that's something that our teachers are already doing, um, which is so impressive. Um, you know, I see it on Twitter. They're putting bags together for kids that. Um, in some instances, they'll be probably dropping off at their houses, or that they, you know, that they'll invite students to come pick up. So they are already brainstorming ways in which that they can provide students with hands-on um, kits, um, so that they can have those experiences, um, not just in application, but in um, the hands-on environment. Great. And then my last comment, it's more of a comment than a question, is just that, um, you know, uh, many of our community members have acknowledged the fact that our teachers and our administrators and our schools are so critical to um, uh, 
just to our community and to our students and to their well-being and and they've equated you know our teachers as being essential workers and I'm, I'm really excited to hear that that's what they consider like that our community considers them so essential um however i just want to make the point that they're very different than essential workers at the grocery store that don't interact um, at the level that we do with children as a teacher would where you're next to a student at a desk or where you're um helping them with their app on the iPad or whatever it is when we're in a hybrid model, there's lots of interactions. Um, it's, it's a very different environment than some of the essential workers that are out there today. And so I appreciate that we're moving in slow. I appreciate the zero depth moving uh, kind of analogy. And I thank you and everyone um, for the thoughtfulness put forward into this plan and the ability to make everybody comfortable, maybe not at the pace that everyone wants to be at comfortable, but um, at a pace that is important for um, our teachers and our students to be able to um, Feel, feel acclimated to our buildings again. So thank you for that. Okay, all right. I think that we have um, exhausted the all of the questions that we have this evening, but as Dan had said, um, this is a fluid process and I know more questions will come. Uh, so we really appreciate um, all of the various answers the, um, and the ability to um, figure out where to go if all your questions weren't answered. Um, we just also wanna say an echo, I think just the continued care um, that we can see in all of these plans and all of this thought and all of this um, work, um, the care for our students, the care for our staff. And we so appreciate the way that um, this plan is gonna be able to help our students and staff um, go back into school safely so that we can have a consistent new school year um, that um, provides students with the very best academically and socially and emotionally that we can. So thank you for your efforts to make this our best work during a pandemic and um, we appreciate that very much. Okay, so now that we have completed um, that part of our agenda, we will go on. Um, I have We have completed our uh, communications, and so we will go on to discussion without action. I do not, oh, actually, we have not completed our communications. Um, we have a president's report and board of education reports. I do not have a president's report this evening. Uh, do we have any board of education reports? Okay, so now we have completed our communications and we will go on to discussion without action. We do not have any discussion without action this evening but we do have discussion with action. So we will go to our discussion with action and that is item 9.01, 2020-2021 calendar revision. Yeah, in a previous communication to the board and the community, I indicated our, uh, our, our interest in pushing back the start of the school year to uh, September 1, 2020, to allow for a more uh, thoughtful, deliberate uh, and intentional planning process to lead up to uh, the beginning of the school year. Um, and so what's loaded in board docs for you, uh, is our proposed calendar for the 2020-2021 school year that shows that and, and the impact of that on the schedule. Uh, Dr. Patrick Knowlton and Mr. Chuck Freund have worked on preparing this calendar. Uh, Chuck, if you have some questions or comments you'd like to make, please. Sure, thank you, Mr. Bridges. Um, just to point out for the board and the community, um, sort of the domino effect of the shift uh, of sep uh, September 1st start date. Um, We've, we've paralleled kind of the beginning of the year for our staff. Uh, so you'll see in there that, you know, our staff officially report back on August 26th, uh, which was parallel to the previous, uh, well, I guess the posted calendar as of right now um, out on the website. Um, also with the uh, September 1st start, um, the trimesters, the quarters, and certainly the semesters also are impacted. Uh, so those are noted. And I suppose the, maybe the most, um, Sort of noteworthy one would be the uh, the end of the first semester, which gets pushed back to uh, January 22nd. Uh, Mrs. Posey and I have had some conversations with uh, with cabinet about kind of what that means, as the board has prioritized in past years um, holding uh, some semester exams before winter break. Um, so making sure that, of course, our students have that winter break uh, free from studying and um, certainly of any kind of long term assignments. Uh, but that she's going to be working with the high schools on on really what exams uh, should look like in this in this very unique school year, 
and, and making sure that our students aren't sort of penalized in, uh, in the month of January for the pushback of a semester. So that will be work that uh, Mrs. Posey will do with, uh, with both high schools. Um, and then um, the end of the year, obviously, um, the, the real sort of, um, you know, change here is, is towards the end of the year as our, our tentative last day of school is now uh, on June 10th, um, making sure that we have all of our school days accounted for. Um, the, the one, um, uh, well, there's many positive changes, I suppose, in this, but one thing to point out specifically would be that the semesters now are, um, are actually almost exactly balanced. Um, that in, in order to, in, in a, by pushing the semester back to January 22nd, we're able to put the semesters at approximately 86, 87 days on, on either side, which is really helpful for, especially in the high school level with courses that run for a semester. Uh, so with that, if there's any questions from the board that uh, either Dr. Knowlton or I can answer, we'd be happy to do that. I'm just simply going to add, first of all, there were some questions about eliminating the emergency days on the calendar. We are required to include those, uh, but through an e-learning platform, uh, you know, that is something we could consider the implementation of on a day when we may uh, have to take a snow day or may have to take a uh, cold day or something like that. But again, we must have those on the calendar. Um, we're required to do so. Uh, there are other emergencies that may require the use of those, so we must have them as a part of the calendar. I see questions from Paul. Is there any hope that the Illinois State Board of Education or the governor will reduce the total number of school days required in light of the, uh, the pandemic conditions? It would be my assumption that as of right now, uh, under current conditions in the current Restore Illinois plan, I do not see that as something that would happen. Thank you. Other questions from the board? I know that this is certainly um, an area similar um, to um, other schools. I, I know that many uh, school districts have pushed back their calendar, I think for similar reasons to our, um, our reasons, i.e. a very difficult um, time getting everything ready for going back to school and making sure that you wanna start on that really that right foot. Um, and so I know that our calendar will look similar to other school districts around us. I, I think everyone I can think of has pushed their calendar back. And so they'll be ending at a certain time and at, the, at a similar time. And that, that's a time that will also coincide with our IHSA revised calendar where we have those sports that are now pushed out into the summer now. So um, our kids will be going to school and they'll also still have their sports that they're, they're going through. I have a couple questions in terms of sort of those end of year things. Um, number one, do we have a tentative graduation date? And number two, um, could we really do some advocating with AP to try to, um, those tests being at the beginning of May, when we're going all the way till the end of, you know, till that June 10th period, it's almost like six weeks later. Um, so just wondering if we can try to really work with them about the, the, the complications of pandemic learning. So we'll have Dr. Knowlton talk to the college board at some point, uh, just uh, about the various testing schedules. I, I don't know how much influence we'll have over it, right. but uh, maybe we can build a board. Now, some of the end of the year stuff, we still need to work out some of the final, final things. We'll work with the high schools, especially on graduation, which I think in our early calendar, we uh, May 17th was a, uh, was identified as the, the graduation date. That that's going to have to slide, and have to move back, and then so we'll we'll continue to work with the high schools and communicate that to the community as, as soon as possible. And in terms of translating what I heard from Mrs. Posey, I just want to reiterate what you said was: kids are going to have a break. We are very aware of the idea of the. We, we don't know exactly how it's going to look and how that's going to work, but we're going to make sure that even though our semester is ending in January and not before the Chris the holiday break that there will be you know, that, that understanding from our schools that the kids need that, that break period. Um, so they won't be spending their whole entire time studying for finals and doing end of the year projects or end of the semester projects. Yes, that's the current discussion I'm having with the, all the secondary, especially the high school leadership. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions about the, oh, Donna? Um, thank you, Chuck, for putting together a calendar that's as balanced as it is. And um, again, I know that there's nothing uh, ideal about anything that we're going through, but um, uh, I, 
you know, I, I think that the, there'll be some concerns from some families um, that we're going that late into June, but there's really nothing that we can, I mean, like we're, we're mandated by the state to have a specific number of days. Um, was there consideration for um, eliminating some of the uh, other days, like maybe um, the day before Thanksgiving or the day, um, I don't know, just other, uh, other ways that we can grab some days back? Is there, was there some thought about that that you can share with us? Um, you know, the, the one piece that we did talk about, um, I'm going to call it version one. I think this is like version six or seven of this calendar. Um, but we had talked a little bit about those April days. Uh, so coming off spring break, we have a, we have an election day on April 6th, which is, um, you know, sort of pending um, based on what happens locally. So we might be able to, to do something there. But um, quite honestly, we didn't talk much about the day before Thanksgiving. Just to note that our board had a resolution. I, I, I know Joe didn't do a um, board report on this. You know, we've had ones in the past, but we do have that um, resolution that we were trying to see if election days could be e-learning days, which would be very helpful in this, in this regard. And you never know, there could be action, right, Joe? Uh, hopefully. Uh, I, that would be a pretty quick turnaround um, you know, from a November uh, meeting. But yeah, hopefully, especially in the future, uh, we could have that uh, under consideration. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I don't think by any, meaning, it, by any means that November 3rd, I think November 3rd is already set in stone that even if we're not in school, in the school buildings, we're still, we still got that, that um, day that the, you know, on our calendar that we won't have school, et cetera. But looking towards those spring ones, that's certainly something we could advocate for, even if we're advocating to ISBE about the ability to do stuff like that for um, election days um, that are consolidated. Those are, you know, consolidated elections, so. Yeah. Okay, um, any other questions on the calendar? Okay, if I have no more questions, I'll take a motion. I entertain a motion to, oh, sorry, you're entertaining it. I'm making it a motion to um, approve item 9.01-2020-2021 calendar revision as presented. Second, Gerke. Okay, a motion and a second are heard. Please call the roll, Mrs. Patton. Leong. Aye. Kosminski. Aye. Wanke. Aye. Kush. Aye. Gerke. Aye. Yang Roar. Aye. Fitzgerald. Aye. Okay, the motion passes. We have adopted our calendar. All right, so now we will move on to old business. I do not have any items under old business. Uh, so we will move to new business. We do not have any items under new business. And so we will move to upcoming events, schedule of events. Yep. Oh, sorry, wrong document. Okay, so the calendar has been updated to reflect. I think we were uh, ambitious that you would approve the calendar uh, to the September 1st, uh, beginning of the school year. Uh, again, we'll show the board meeting currently uh, as PSAC. The governor has extended the executive order allowing for virtual meetings through uh, August 22nd. So board leadership will discuss the format for the next board meeting. Uh, and then uh, as we have better clarity now about the rest of the year, we'll begin to populate the remainder of the calendar. But again, a reminder, our next board meeting is scheduled for the 17th. Okay, I have a question from Joe. With um, graduation being pushed uh, from May 17th, will our May 18th meeting, which is a Tuesday, be moved back to that Monday, uh, the 17th? So the board takes action on setting those meeting dates. Uh, so the board would have to have that conversation and we'd have to uh, do that. So I mean, I just say you approved, uh, through board action, you approved the calendar of meetings. Um, so if that's something we would wish to do, that's probably a good catch. Joe didn't even think of that. So that'll something that we can do as a proposal at a, at a future board meeting. Okay, great. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so I think that that will be that concludes our upcoming events, and that brings us to item thirteen adjournment. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn, Janet uh, Yang Roar. Second, Kazminski. Okay, a motion and a second are heard. Please call the roll. Yang Roar? Aye. Kush? Aye. Fitzgerald? Aye. Wanke? Aye. Kosminski? Aye. Leong? 
Aye. Garkey. Aye. Okay, the motion passes. We are adjourned. Good night, everyone.